Hello. We might be live. Am I live? Let me know if I'm live. I'm going to go ahead and double check and make sure everything is working. Welcome. This is going to be a late live stream because I had to spend like my mic was having problems, tech issues. As always, I'm always having tech issues. Okay, let me make sure everything is working and then we'll get into our topics tonight and uh, we will we will clip these things later. Okay, it looks like it is working. And looks like my mic sounds good, so it was worth it. Hey, hello, Frog of Anarchist Productions. Right, you came at a good, oh good, I'm glad I came at a good time. Um, I'm a little later than I had planned on coming live today. Um, and then I was having um, audio issues, and so then I thought maybe I wouldn't do this at all. And then I was like, fuck it. We're doing it. So I just hit the live button. So here we are. Tonight we're going to talk about a couple different things that have come up. Um, I'm just going to talk real a little bit about Bread Left is Tube. I want to talk a little bit about why um, collectively as a society we kind of suck at having conversations. Particularly uh, millennials and younger. Um... Oh, hold on. What else do I want to talk about? Oh, yeah, I have a I have a, a fun um, story about an amazing um, African queen that I thought was really interesting. And I wanted to give some positive, uh, positive stuff. And I was just tickled by this story. So I thought I would share that tonight. Ooh, 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 ooh. Get back in there. There we go. Um, and then we're going to talk. A little bit about postmodernism. We might talk about postmodernism first. I don't know. We'll see. No, no, no. We're going to start with um, with uh, just a few things about bread too. We're going to start with bread too. Um, I'm excited to talk about postmodernism though because I my definition of postmodernism was a collective definition from people who had described it on. Um, on YouTube channels I had watched. Uh, and so it was kind of a contextual understanding. And this weekend, me and my fiance spent a, a couple hours going through and trying to understand really what postmodernism is. And so I might do like a video essay on it as well, separate that kind of talks about different things. But <laughs> I also just wanted to do a rant <laughs> because it's, whew. I don't think it's a philosophy that's going to be helping us. All right. So let's start out by talking about, um, and this is going to be in general. Um, I, I, I'm not wanting to, I don't want to do drama. <laughs> I don't want to do response videos. Um, I'm not trying to do any of that. I just want to talk collectively about the leftist space. And this isn't just on YouTube. Um, there are other, you know, Twitter, there's other social media platforms that I just feel like as far as people on the left, and I'm using that very, very loosely, okay? I want people to understand that when I say leftist, my actual probably political views are not on a chart, a spectrum chart of from, from right to left or left to right, right? So when I say leftist, it's just because that's the collective word we've described, we've decided as a society to use to call people who are more, I don't even want to use progressive, um, who are anti-capitalist, okay, uh, or for human rights, right? Um, socialism, socialist, communist, anarchist, but like I am to like, I'm, I'm so left. I'm off the chart. I'll just say that. Okay. <laughs> um, so I don't like using, excuse me. I don't like our, the, the terminology we have for the, some of these things, but that's what we have. So I 
To communicate properly, we need to define terminology. It's in a couple of my videos. I've talked about it before. And so uh, I'd like to define leftists as being people who are on the progressive side. I'm not talking about neoliberals. <laughs> I'm not talking about Democrats. Leftists. Okay. Um, yeah, people who know something's wrong and actually think something can be done about it. Well, are trying to do something about it. You'll, you'll understand as I get more into this topic. Okay, so I love a bread tube leftist video essay. I make my own. Clearly, the first one I did was seven and a half hours long. Clearly. <laughs> like, I support this medium. Um, I hate hearing people... Mm, almost deflate or downplay that type of content and the power that it has in revolutionary movement, um, in online, I don't know, nope, I'm not going to say online discourse, but online recruitment and education. I hear a lot of video essayist um, people on the left when it comes to content saying, this is entertainment. Um, I hope to entertain you <laughs> with my content, but that is the second goal. <laughs> okay. My main goal is to share knowledge and education right because that's what this platform is for is for is to get knowledge and education out right to get ideas being brainstormed or to give people to share ideas with people of things they can implement in their own life in their own community right um sorry my camera is being an ass it's supposed to autofocus and i hate when it does this <laughs> It annoys me because I can't move as much. Um, so, what was I saying? I love a video essay, but my first, like, goal is not to entertain people. And I'm sorry, but there's plenty of people out there to entertain you. There's plenty of people with viewpoints that, similar to I, that, similar to what I have, well, maybe not too, yeah, on the same side, that want to just make entertaining content, th things that are funny, TikTok, right? But if we're in a, if I'm having a serious hour and a half video essay talking about leftist ideas or uh, concepts or whatever, um, I'm watching that. I'm, I'm committing an hour and a half of my time to watching that because I figure I'm going to learn something that's the goal, right? And that's going to be the, that's the goal in the content I'm creating as well. I entertainment is second. Um, yeah. Frog of the, of anarchist productions. I love that. I consider many of y'all philosophers. Thank you. I do as well. <laughs> like I know, I, I know it may not be popular and I may get shit for this, but yes, I consider myself a philosopher. Um, you guys may not have read all, not, not have you all may not have gotten to experience all of my new philosophy because it's it's like a lot of work <laughs> like like researching and bringing ideas together critically thinking and then coming up with like new ideas so that's one reason why i have these channels i'm looking forward like i've got so many ideas so many like video ideas topics i need to cover the, I keep adding videos to the list every day and I, I can't knock them off the list as quickly as I can add them on. Um, which is why I've, again, decided to focus um, more on that type of content and get away less from talking about people on the left or personalities on the left. Um, I'm not here to be a personality. Please don't start a parasocial relationship with me. <laughs> um, I know I'm. I, I know that this is this is a fear that I have, and it's also something I'm actively trying to brainstorm ideas to avoid. Which is how do I not get sucked up into the content creator sphere? Um, how do I not 
uh, how do I encourage people who watch my content to create healthy, non-parasocial relationships? <laughs> Use me as an educator and teacher. I hope to meet you in person. I will definitely be traveling. I will come and like uh, do anarchist things in your area. Um, but don't create a parasocial relationship with me. One, I will probably disappoint you. I am human. Don't put me on a pedestal. I hate that. <laughs> um, uh, and two, it's like I'm an anarchist. I'm an anarchist. And I don't believe in unconsensual hierarchies. Um, and these spaces will create that socially. You don't have to have it written down in a book for or written down officially to know that there are hierarchies going on. We all know that social hierarchies create nat are created naturally within social groups by whoever is most charismatic or maybe the most funny, like these things happen naturally. So anyways, that was a side little notion of like trying to avoid letting the sickness of power overtake you, even though to be part of the movement you will have to ha be a leader, if that makes sense, right? You you will have to have a sense of power. But like, I I don't like I, scared, deathly scared of being in that position because I don't want to succumb to that. And so I I need whoever I'm I need the people I'm leading to be courageous and knowledgeable and educated enough to be able to revoke, um, revoke authority figures consent to authority, right? Be able to be like, okay, great job on all that. Maybe we should let these people come in for this because they know this better. Or like, maybe we need to reconvene and make sure everything's, maybe you just need a little break. Like that's the balance of those type of dynamics, right? Um, hello, base Colton Buddha. Thank you. Amazing video. And yes, great philosophy. Thank you. Um, sorry. And then, uh, frog of anarchist production said, uh, Better yet, y'all are philosophers, philosophers, let me see if I can read, with the language of the people, yeah, rather than the ivory tower. Yes, and that is definitely my goal with all my content, is I get very frustrated in my research when I read a sentence that is like three lines long with a bunch of big words. And then when I break the sentence down to be like, what does this actually mean? What is this actually saying? I'm like, well, if you just said it like that, most people could understand when they read it. It's like we it's like we write things more complicated so that there are so we can create more classes or less access to information. Even some of the like neurology stuff that I've been learning, right? That people would be like, you can't talk about that confidently unless you have a PhD in, you know, neuroscience or whatever. And it's like, well, no, some of these concepts. If you just look up the definitions of the words they're using, it's really, they're not as overwhelming to try to understand. Um, to the point where I'm like, some of these things we should be teaching <laughs> growing in like, uh, in, in school before kids are 18, because we should know how we work. I just think that's really important. I'm, I get very disappointed at how much I was not taught how we work. Okay, I keep getting sidetracked, but... BreadTube. I love watching videos on BreadTube. I love the educational content. I think we need to give ourselves more credit for what we are what we are creating and stop diminishing it by saying, it's just entertainment. This doesn't really change anything, right? Um, although making video content online and creating online communities may not be in real life praxis, it is a tool that we have in the modern era to educate and connect with other people. And we should use it that way. Um, and we should use it that way as a priority to also in avoid those toxic parasocial um, spaces that just end up being echo chambers, which can happen on every single side of politics. Um, echo chambers around a cult of personality. And we need to also avoid those pit stops or those holes uh, that will get in our way along our, our journey to revolution. That leads me into saying a lot of content that I watch on the left really um, hits me emotionally. 
right? It's an identity uh, marker that I have or that someone close to me has, or it's something that, a, a you know, some big corporation is doing and I'm pissed off or I'm saddened by who's being harmed by this thing or how people feel about this thing. But then I get to the end, it, like, I, I get to the part of the video essay, I'm watching the video essay, and I'm like, oh, oh, emotion, I feel it, oh, rage, oh, sadness. And, and, and then it just ends. Right? It's like, here's a bunch of sad, horrific things. We should fix that. Like and subscribe. And I'm like, uh, uh, mm -hmm. gonna give any how to's or send us in a direction of people who have answers to these questions? Or are we just gonna walk away from this video kind of sad and depressed? Which is how I walk away from a lot of leftist content these days. Sad, depressed, kind of hopeless. If you're going to, if, if people talk about a very instrumental like thing, especially if we're going to do an hour, an hour and a half video essay that is emotional. Like we, I, like I am, we are going through, like these can be very emotional roller coasters sometimes, uh, creating them and watching this content because we're talking about collective societal trauma from capitalism. But if you can't leave any hope at the end of your video, you're not helping. The world is hopeless out here right now. That's one reason why we can't organize, um, why people don't want to do things, is because we have to admit we are overwhelmed with the hopelessness of, of what we're even talking about doing. And I think a lot of us would love to just live in the fantasy world that we've created where we're already in the free, the, the afterworld, the free communist society. And I think a lot of people are okay just living in that fantasy and then like making activist content, not genuinely believing that anything is going to change. And to me, that's the most depressing thing I could ever think of. Um, I'm not here. I'm not committing my whole life. Change Like I didn't like make anarchy part of my entire value system and how I live my life every single day because I don't think it's possible we'll get there in my lifetime. I, that's not why I made this commitment, right? Like I made this commitment to this work and to this philosophy and to my own personal work to get us to, to, um, be part of, of, of a community that is moving in that direction because I, genuinely believe it can happen. And people who don't genuinely believe that it can happen, please get out of our way. You're not helping. It's depressing. It's kind of depressing. Uh, we, we need to, we need to present a problem, right? Like this is, Actually, I think I wrote this. I, I actually wrote this down. How videos tend tend to be. They explain the history of a problem. They give studies, stories, data. Um, they explain how this is still a problem now, or how it's been, it's gotten worse. Um, and then there are abstract, non grounded ideas for change. Examples: Be nice to other. Be nicer to others. Love yourself. Uh, reach out to your Congress member. <laughs> Do better. Right. Um, and then the video ends and these aren't concrete how to's on what people can do to actually affect change. And so people may try to do that or they might be like, yeah, I've heard that in every single fucking video. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that actually entails me doing. Right. Love myself. What does that actually mean? Don't worry. We're going to get into it. Follow disruptive philosophies. I've already like, yeah, but, um, abstract ideas even about like uh concrete issues right we're talking about racism we're talking about um abolition right uh as far as prison like prison abolition cop abolition i've heard 
widely this concept being talked about where we're constantly talking about what the end result looks like. But I have not heard people break down in an accessible way, step one, on how we go from where we are right now to a restorative justice, no racist cop society, right? Like, what is that process? And we need to be talking about that because we don't talk about that. And you just look, if you're constantly just looking at this destination you're trying to get there, trying to go to, but you have no idea how to get there. You've never made a step forward. You don't know what step one is. You're talking about step 18, but you're still, you know, on zero. No one's getting anywhere. No one's getting anywhere. And you will become more depressed and more delusion. Like you'll be, you'll become more depressed with the delusion of seeing this goal, right? And never progressing forward, never actually taking time to figure out, okay, I'm at point A, how do I get to point B? What are all the steps in between? So I would love to challenge people who are watching this to challenge other content creators or just to challenge content creators to when you talk about a topic for an hour and a half that you know is going to be heavy, take an extra time to research to give some levity at the end, to give some hope at the end, right? Let people know. Well, they do let people know, to be honest. But like, I would love to know what these people would need to see or hear to have more hope, to think that this is something. I could do in my lifetime, right? Um, and some of these people have audiences that are large enough that we could collect data on those kind of things, right? On like, what would give you more hope um, that would help you move or, or um, move towards action? Based on Yoon psychology and the demographics of different personality types that we have in society, which again, we're going to be getting into the dirty, dirty details. I'm working on scripts. <sighs> They're long. Um, on some more of that. But based on that, uh, there's about 25 to 30 percent of society that does a lot of the teaching. Um, everyone teaches, right? But they do a lot of the how to figuring out and whether they teach directly or they help teach teachers or whatever, it's about 25 to 30% of the population that that is a priority cognitive function for them, that that is a role that they have in society. So I do understand that like, it's, it's not the, um, I say that to say it's not maybe the go-to for every content creator to think of like, now I need to give a how to, but when we're talking about people's like full ass value system, identity, and like the future of humanity, whether our children are going to be here in the next, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, whether it's going, whether we're going to go into another deep, dark depression or, uh, you know, the fascists are going to win. I think we're going to need to give some hope if we want to keep people moving or even interested in talking about it because it's getting dark and depressing. And I'm someone who normally is the one bringing the dark and depressing. Um, and I'm finding that I want to focus on how to do things. So maybe my, both of my channels, Disrupted Bodies and Philosophy will provide a little bit more hope and joy. Uh, because good Lord, there is not much hope or joy on either side of these arguments. Um, and I don't know how else to encourage people. I don't know how else to look like the better option than being a community full of hope and joy. The fascists don't look like they have the most joy. I mean, they definitely had hope for the future, but like not a lot of joy, right? Neoliberals, not really jo joyful. Um, uh, Margaret Thatcher wasn't described as a joyous, happy woman, right? But like, we're we're communists, we're anarchists, we're leftists. We're we're preaching love, freedom, self-expression, 
all things that create joy. So we should maybe find more joy to talk about on our side, or it's gonna get it's gonna get brutal out here. Uh, that's the only way you get through the dystopianness of a late stage capitalism. We have to have places of joy. If y'all are watching The Last of Us, okay, the last episode, they had a few moments of joy. And like that was really needed to like keep the hope going. Okay. It's no spoilers. Keeping it abstract. Okay. Um, let me check back on the chat and then we will get into the next topic. Uh, Fred, oh, sorry, not Fred. I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Frog of Anarchist Productions. The internet isn't just a toy. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Like, The internet is not just entertainment. And if that is your perception, then I would invite you to explore other other parts of the internet. I just realized in the last couple of years that YouTube was being used as an entertainment platform for like, until I started, like even when I was starting my um, rope uh, YouTube channel, the MP experience, I was still under the pressure that like you went to YouTube to learn how to do things. I don't know how to do this, how to. Like that is how YouTube like cr was created. That that's the <laughs> foundation of the type of videos that really built up YouTube. A lot of it was how to. I was shocked when I realized that there were whole like vlogs and podcasts and people just come on here for entertainment like TV. Like this is relatively <laughs> 6 7 years ago, I think. Uh, it was relatively new to me. I was out of the loop. Okay? Uh, but that's mainly what I used YouTube for. So, yeah. Uh, based Col Colton Buddha said, uh, guess we're still trying to figure the answer to that. Yes. I, I don't, I, I wish again, we would use the platform to have more group discussions about those answers. Brainstorming sessions, right? Uh, pan you can have five, six, seven panelists. We all know how to do the live streams. Uh, Star College says people forgot how to be human. Say it again for the people in the bag. <laughs> they forgot how to be human. We have forgotten how to be a human. Like seriously, like we've, I actually, let's be fair. We haven't forgotten. We've been, it's been abused out of us. We've been traumatized out of being human. No one has been, no one has shown us humanity, not even our own parents in many situations. That how would we know how to do that? Someone would have to teach you. That's the whole point of childhood, <laughs> to be taught, right? How we're supposed to behave or how we're supposed to discover ourselves as a human being and also how we treat other human beings. And we have forgotten. That is why, again, I just love that people keep pointing out reasons why I'm making the content I do. Uh, I think in my description of my channels, it literally says uh, relearning how to be human or like learning how to be hum how to be human. Because we've forgotten. We've forgotten on such an epic scale that that I'm horrified that it takes everything inside me to not walk outside and start shaking people about like, how do we treat fucking children like that? Like, what are we doing? What are we doing? Like, everything inside of me. To not understand why millions of us are just running out of our house raging. I don't know how we do it. But when we're ready, I'm, a, I'm right there. I am ready. But it takes a lot to see, think, Turkey, Ohio, things going on in the news right now that are horrific and inhumane. And we just, we just wake up and continue our loops. Wake up, brush your teeth, go to work, da 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 go sleep, wake up, go to work, da 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 Hopefully someday it will change. And we just, right? So 
there's 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 living on blind hope and just saying hopefully it'll change <laughs> right and then there's realistic hope right but we're in this place of like hopelessness like a lot of people that used to have blind hope i uh, have are leaning towards more towards nihilism at this point and as a black woman as a black woman in touch with her ancestors nihilism's not the answer okay if if what if if colonizers are in control of the world for the last what five six hundred fucking years thousand years whatever else and then like the species ends without colonized people being liberated i'm gonna at least let black people know ancestors gonna be pissed they're gonna be pissed if like climate change starts literally wiping out the species and we still in bondage. It's crazy. I don't know how we're not more mad. Um, okay, let me get through these. Yeah, it's like, it's like giving people a lump of metal, yeah, and not teaching them how to make a sword, exactly. You're being nice to the little voices in your head <laughs> was really helpful video. Oh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much, actual table. Being nice to the voices in your head. I had a video on that, uh, a clip on that for my last live stream. Hope requires options. People feel hopeless when they don't have options, methinks. I agree, I agree. But also, people don't know they have options. And that is our job as educators, as content creators, is to let you know what the options are so you are not hopeless. Because we should have figured them out. That's why we put ourselves in these positions. Um, base Colton Buddha said agreed. Seems like a lot of creators in this sphere offer little action and more um, little action more on money. Their joy is in delusion. <laughs> Base Colton Buddha is always based, okay? Helps them cope with the destruction they cause. Yeah. Uh, I'm not calling anyone out because they all do it. But I, please, call me a hypocrite. Call me out. If you ever, 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 ever see me being like, and today's video is sponsored by BetterHelp, a VPN. Name other things. Those are conflicting value systems. And I know that Hassan has made this a very gray area. But if you are if you're if you're an anarchist, a leftist, a communist, and this is your value system that you live every single day, and also a YouTuber, you can't take corporate sponsorships. You can't. There's other ways to fund. You can't start talking about a topic, give 10 minutes of it, and then be like, make sure to subscribe to my Patreon if you want to get all of the how-tos or all of the rest of the information. Um, yeah, Disrupted Bodies. Yeah, Disrupted Bodies sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. <laughs> like, call me out. Cancel me, okay? Delete me. Unsubscribe if I ever get to that point. I need to be held that accountable because I'm, there's a part of me that's seen it happen to so many people that I'm like, apparently you just can't help yourself. Apparently you get to 100,000 subscribers and it doesn't matter who you are. You go, yep, now I'm taking a sponsorship. And I just hope that's not true. Because like, I hope I can fight that. Um, okay. Uh, seems like a lot of creators in the sphere offer little, yeah, actually more money, da, da, da. I think we really do miss fun in protests, like when the hippies tried to levitate the Pentagon and shake out all the evil. Yes, Chad Alpha. Yeah, I think we, we're wasting a lot of our imagination on the delusion of the future utopian we want to have, like utopia we want to have. When like, we could be using that imagination energy to come up with ideas like pretending to levitate the fucking Pentagon as a, as a protest, right? Coming up with creative, more creative ways to protest that make, that are going to make the media because they can't not make the media because they're going to go viral. We should spend more time 
uh, using our imagination to imagine those types of things than using our imagination to imagine all the things that could go wrong or to just uh, imagine a world where none of these problems exist in our head and living in that. Uh, Base Colton, the Buddha says, we've mistaken value as money and not skills to help our community. Woo. Amen. Amen. We've replaced money for relationship. Like, sorry, not replace money. We've replaced relationship with money. Let me say that the right way. We've replaced relationship with money. Okay? You pay people to show appreciation these days. That's, again, why it's tough doing this content online, right? People want to show their appreciation. The way they know how to do it is through money. Like, and there are, this is not just counting. I, I want to make sure to say this. Like, I may have a Patreon in the future. It will be cheap. It will not be something that I'm like promoting all the time because to be honest, I don't need this source of income. I think that's one thing I hope helps. Yes, it will be nice, but like I'm working on writing a book. There are other ways that I can bring in sources of income that aren't this. Um, as well as I have, I mean, I have a very supportive and loving partner. Donnie De, uh, De Nadio, oh yeah, said, <laughs> that's what you said before, actual table, tenant unions, labor unions, mutual aid networks, revolution requires organization, the tenant org I'm in talks to labor unions, we got to build those connections between each other and build power. Absolutely, I agree. Um, I will add on to that though, that I think for people who are in the mix, we know what that means, tenant orgs, labor unions, and those steps to get there. There's a lot of people who don't. And that's where I think the disconnect is, is like there are some people that have no idea what a tenant org is, how you would what it would do for them, how you would organize that. Right. Um, or tenant unions, um, mutual aid networks. Right. I. I have a, a radical viewpoint on mutual aid. Especially as someone who is, again, a black femme queer person. I am not trying to take money from one group of poor people, proletariat, forgotten proletariat, and move it to another, like I'm not trying to rob Peter to pay Paul. Does that make sense? And so I think there should be a more, well, I know there's creative ways you can do it as well, but you could also just be more bold about when we are talking about raising money. It should be coming from the people who have it. Middle class, upper middle class, bourgeoisie. Um, and there are ways to get it. Like we have all the entertainment outside of like the YouTube stuff we do. Like I dance, I'm writing comedy. I work on music. Like these are all these artistic skills that a lot of those people from those classes don't do, don't have, and also appreciate and will pay money for. Um, so there are ways to try to siphon money for things from people who have it and not from the disadvantaged. Um, so I'm I'm an advocate for mutual aid, but I also want people to know that mutual aid doesn't always mean money. Sometimes that means getting off your fucking ass and painting a wall or driving someone to the doctor, right? Instead of just sending a check. Um, that's a privilege, to be honest, to be able to send a check. I, there's many times I would like to send mutual aid and I'm, I, made, I don't have that money to send, but I do have like an able body with lots of skills, but that's oftentimes not accepted. Depending on the situation. Okay, um, base Colton the Buddha, but I absolutely agree. We have to work with each other and build dual power, uh, actual table. And part of that is, again, my disruptive philosophy channel is why I'm breaking down like getting to know self and healing from trauma and all those things because we can't build those connections between each other and build power if we don't know how to talk to each other and we're all riddled with unconscious complexes from trauma. It just doesn't work. Uh, Donnie uh, Den uh, Denadio said, what sort of book if you'd like to share? Um, yeah, I am working on uh, a philosophy, um, psychology philosophy book that kind of updates a lot of Yoon, Carl Yoon, um, and 
MBTI type of uh, psychology to like help understand yourself and growth and your decision making process within your uh, within yourself. Um, a big part of it is actually connecting all of the aspects of Carl Jung's research and not just these cognitive functions that we get these stereotypical MBTI type of personality for capitalism systems and tools. Uh, this is uh, the philosophy, and I will be talking about this on my on disruptive philosophy as well, or explaining some of this concept, and the book will go into more detail. Uh, these are tools to actually help organized, organize anarchist societies because it helps us find out what our roles are within a collectivist community or an anarchist community, right? And how we find our individuality within those spaces. Uh, they're human archetypes. This is genetics, evolution. Like these things can be, you can see these things have been passed down in uh, human evolution for over 10,000 years. So instead of trying to create something new, like instead of trying to figure out something new or creating postmodernism or neo shit, um, I would like to go back to what we were doing before. We fucked everything up. Going back to the original, the prime, the archetype. And so, yeah, it's going to, it, it will be a, a philosophy. It, it connects spirituality. Um, it's going to connect psychology. It is based off a lot of research from other people. And then my new philosophies and learnings since I've been deeply researching uh, and studying this for the last six or seven years with my fiance. He's, we're writing the book together because we did this together. So, um, and then I, I, I think I am also not think I am also working on my memoir that will go into, you know, the childhood trauma, uh, frog of anarchist. I would definitely love more stuff for kids. Like I'm 18 out of school and trying here, but I don't have the most direct avenues to anarchy. And so, yes, I like the idea of how to develop more alternative forms of anarchist activity. Yes. And I will say like, kids are the biggest emphasis right now. Um, for me and that right now, like forever and the rest of the revolution, like the goal, like it's children, children, children. They are the future. Uh, they are the, they are my motivation for why I am, you know, doing the work I am doing. Um, I never wanted to have kids ever. And I have since realized, oh, that was because of trauma. <laughs> and actually, I might be a great mother and uh, have considered, uh, me and my fiance are actually considering it. And I'm someone who, th that's hard for me to say because I have to swallow my ego and admit publicly that I've said many times publicly that I think it's selfish people having children right now because the world's going to fucking end. But this is also me having hope. This is also called love. Where my fiance and I are so in love with each other, we need another being to express it to the universe. And that's, I think, a core reason why you should have children. When there's so much love between two people, it's like, oh my God, we need a whole nother being to continue to express our love. And I don't think that's a core reason why people have kids. <laughs> so yes, we will definitely be doing more of that. Base Colton, do you feel like uh, there is a line that can be crossed with selling to the bourgeoisie, like in creating commodities for the consumption? At what point do we become the commodity? Well, I, we, again, it's your individual decision, right? Not everyone may not, to, may not want to be a commodity, but, or may not want to uh, look at it that way. I d we're commodities no matter what, right? Whether you work at Amazon, you're sacrificing your back and your knees, whether you're a stripper and you're, you know, sacrificing your body, whether you work in an office and you're si sacrificing your psyche, whether you work in the military and you're psych sacrificing your psyche, we're all a commodity for capitalism, right? So it's an individual decision on where that line is for you, right? I used to teach... Um, a lot of like adult relationship, um, you know, alternative lifestyle classes, rope bondage type of things. I like, that's what my other channel does. I got out of that space because I was doing a lot of healing work 
Like a lot of the stuff I was doing was healing people and very personal. Oh my gosh, this fucking camera is going to drive me crazy. Just focus and like follow my eyes. Doesn't want me to move. See, every fucking thing in capitalism is trying to control who you are and your self-expression. <laughs> um, so I think that's an individual decision for each person, right? I got to a point where like, oh, I can't sell that anymore. It doesn't feel good, right? Um, and there are some things within this space that I will not present, I won't present in that way. I'm not going to advertise that way. I'm not going to sell it. If someone asks for it, I'll be like, yeah, I'll do that for free. Or like, can we trade for services? Right. Or, you know, but there are some, but that is an individual decision based on each person on what that, what that means to you. Right. For me, rope has very, like, is much part of my own personal healing um, and healing I've had with other people. It's very intimately connected in my relationship with my fiance. And so it felt weird selling experiences for that. And now I have a little bit stronger, stricter boundaries about, like, needing to, like, know somebody <laughs> um, to play or to, you know, do that kind of thing. I have individual people that I mentor, um, and kind of like a master teacher type of relationship rather than teaching at like a convention over a weekend, if that makes sense. So, and that's something, yeah, like I've had to, I've already planned for with this kind of content and my books and stuff like that is like, where is that line for me? But yeah, I do think there, there is a line, right? You can only sell yourself as a commodity. Like if you start selling other people as a commodity, especially if it's not consensual, right? Not as a group with the same power, like where everyone has uh, the same power structure, well then that's, that's capitalism, right? So that's probably the line. Actual table. I think one line would be compromising on your politics for money. Opportunism as Marxist, Marxists call it. Yeah. Our labor is already the commodity though. Yeah, no, we're already the commodity, but yeah, it really is. Um, you know, how much are, how much are you sacrificing who you are and your value system for that? And that's where that line is. I think only you can decide that for you, um, which is anarchism, <laughs> right? Is, is a freedom that we want to live in is that you make your own decisions for yourself. Okay. Next topic. That one went longer than I thought it was, but I got sidetracked. Let's talk about why younger generations suck at having conversations. <laughs> why we suck at having in real life communication and conversations with people. I hear a lot uh, of, of time spent, like I, I really had to break this down and go back to, I'm 36, I had to go back to my 20s and remember like, what was I doing when I was going out with my friends in the 20s, in, in my 20s, when social media was not important, we did not have a tickety-tockety, there was no Snapchat. Um, I think the biggest thing that happened during that party time was that you could check in on Facebook. <laughs> like, right? What did we do together? What did we talk about, right? Because I got together with my friends all the time for hours and we were just taught, just, there was never any sort of uh, struggle to keep conversation, to keep it flowing, going. Did you hear about this? Did you hear about this? Oh my God, that reminds me of this story. Da, 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 da. If anything, we talked too much. Um, but I hear this a lot. I've been seeing this on the Tiki Talkie. People are talking about it. I have autism. I have social anxiety. I don't know how to have a conversation. I don't know how to talk to people. People don't want to listen to me. So I wanted to dive into this and just give a few thoughts on why I think this is happening. One, yeah, internet, social media, big part of it. Here's why. Social media allows us to share our lives share the stories in our lives without having to actually communicate or tell someone's story, right? We can show them, right? What'd you do last week? Here, look at my TikTok. I can show you. I did a video of the whole thing. I didn't actually live it. I videoed the whole thing. 
right? Instead of what I remember doing growing up, not growing, sorry, growing up in my 20s, was telling people stories. That's why we had so much to talk about, right? I couldn't record the whole thing I did last weekend with my other friends. Now that I'm with this friend, I'm going to have to tell them stories. Yeah. So fucking David came and he was with his new girlfriend, Shelly. And then Shelly ran into the old girlfriend. And then there was da 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 da. And then, and then I was getting a drink. And it was so funny. This girl came in and she was like, shut up. And then my boyfriend came over and he slapped my butt. And we were like, you want to go? Like, <laughs> I'm making this up. This is an actual story. But, I, you know, I had some crazy times in my 20s. Um, we, told pe- we told people stories. We had to tell stories. We had to remember what happened or you couldn't tell the story. If something really funny happened, you had to remember it. You couldn't record it. Nowadays, like, we have so many cameras everywhere because me and my fiance, we're we are, we like, we're kinky. We, we're a little sadists. We enjoy watching like army fails and videos where people are doing stupid shit and they fuck up and they fall and it's funny, right? The amount of videos that, uh, that the amount of videos that are happening and that we're, the amount of shit that we are recording in our everyday life allows us to have whole YouTube channels that are just clips of videos of that people have taken and have no problem sharing on the internet of their lives of being an idiot of a story, right? I walked outside my house. It was so icy. It was like 32 degrees out. And I took like my first step, my sex, the second step. And I felt that I was, I was not going to make it and slid all the way down through the yard all the way. And then ran into the mailbox almost like right on my thigh right here almost hit pelvic bone almost broke my pelvic bone right that's a story that's a rough draft right of a story to give an example right now that if i was really going to explain it and act it out because i to be honest i like to be very physical in my story retellings May, may take five, 10 minutes to like tell the story. It's, I want people to have the experience with me, right? Like I slid down the stairs and I was sliding down the grass and I was like, ah, right? To experience it. Or, or I could show you a 10 second clip. What do you think is gonna connect us more on a human level? Especially if we're in real life. We, we vlog and put on our stories and TikTok about our lives, one, instead of living it. And therefore, we don't remember as much. We don't even consciously, like, we'll consciously tell ourselves that we don't need to, ha- to keep that memory alive because we took a picture because we filmed it right? But then we can't connect with people because we don't have any stories to tell them because we've forgotten how to tell stories. We've forgotten that like, oh, that's what we did. That's what humans, that's how we teach kids by telling stories. That's how we explain, uh, uh, that's how we mediate problems between people, telling stories, giving each other the background, right? That's how we create deep bonds with people by sharing stories of our life before they were in it. It's how we coach and mentor people, right? Coach and mentor spends a lot of time, should be spending a lot of time telling their students or um, their, yeah, their student or students, players, all the stories about how they fucked up. (laughs) You know how I know not to do that? Let me tell you a story. We're we're in a show don't tell society, right? Which only works in media. <laughs> like it only works in movies and books, which are stories, right? But it doesn't work in the story of our everyday life. 
when it comes to connecting with people, that's the whole point is they weren't there. We can't show them. We have to tell them. I mean, we can show them in a way where we can like recreate it. Right. But we can't show them the exact like do it less. You can still record stuff if you want. I mean, I don't know. I think I don't think you really live in if you behind the screen personally, but at least spend time to tell your friends stories about your life and see if you don't have more to talk about <laughs> and see if you don't make more authentic friendships and relationships. Alexander, uh, excuse me, my fiance has stories for all of these different uh, uh, decorations in his bedroom, right? Oh, I got that with my dad when I was in Italy, or I got that when I was in Yemen studying, you know, Islam, or I, I um, oh, it was so crazy. I met this person and then I went to the, like, he's always got these stories and I have to like remind him to tell me. I'm like, look, I love you. Okay. And I want to know everything, everything. Did you stub your toe when you were two? When you went to some museum? I want to know. Tell me the story. <laughs> That's how you get to know someone. If you guys watched my um, last video before I um, video essay on disruptive philosophy on how to love, I talk about this <laughs> on getting to know someone. And I was trying, I've been thinking about like, how do I break that down? So it's accessible getting to know someone. It's their story. Do you know their story? Do you know some of their story? That's who they are. That's part of who we are. Like who we are <laughs> is our memories things we've done in the past, our story. And the way you get to love, the way you really genuinely love someone is, is, a, is, a, is memory plus time equals love. And I'm not just talking about romantic love, okay? I'm talking about in friendships, relationships, uh, parenting, whatever else. And the longer you know someone, the more stories you get to create with them, the more stories of them you remember, the deeper that love turns into. We have also not only forgotten about our story, our personal story, but we've also turned those personal stories into anecdotes. Anecdotes that aren't considered valid in our very monophasic science-based culture. We live in a very if it's not provable with our five senses, it's not real or truth or something that we can believe. We discount dreams, we discount visions, we discount spirituality unless it is unless it is Christianity or Abrahamic religions, which are also based in monophasic cultures. Uh, monophasic basically means, again, like I was mentioning, reality is only the five truth and reality is only the five senses. Right. So, again, that disregards uh, a lot of spirituality, a lot of vision que que quest, um, active imagining, dreams, hunches, intuition, like a lot of those things would be discounted from any sort of valid truth. Um, and this is very specific to westernized cultures. It's not something that. Is it was common in other traditional cultures, pagan cultures, African cultures, like all those cultures are rooted in some sort of spirituality that is polyphasic, which means, no, our dreams are real. Our inner world and those voices are true and we should listen to them. And that is a part of our reality that we are experiencing as a human being. So right now, anecdotes are considered not even valid. Uh, people have to apologize on social, on YouTube, when they are talking about, oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to give a quick personal anecdote. We want to talk about losing our humanity. Why the fuck would a human have to apologize when we're talking and advocating about human fucking rights? Why would they have to apologize for sharing their story or anecdote? I hope people understand that the statistics 
that we have, the numbers that we have, the graphs are 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 data without without story, without without the humans behind it, right? But also that data was created by getting a bunch of anecdotal information, a bunch of anecdotal stories. This is also why we're not supposed to live in a very generalized culture, right? Where we have to put people in very generalized categories because humans are not generalized like that. It's why we lived in more tribal societies or smaller communities so that the groups of people that had similar lifestyles and viewpoints and, you know, pagan deities they worshipped or whatever, they cohabitated together and they communed with other communities as well. But there wasn't like you didn't have to fit millions of people into really generic categories that are always going to miss out on the nuances, the actual beauty in the in individual and their anecdotal story. But their stories are who the fuck they are. Like our stories are part of who the fuck we are. And whether you are famous or not, whether five people or 10 or 20 or a million people remember you, you affected a part of the universe, a part of everyday reality for those five people. They're going to remember you forever, whether it's your children, whether it's um, people on your YouTube channel, whatever else, people you actually know that you have a relationship with. Your story as a human, your anecdotes are what they're remembering. So we should maybe treat them like they're important. We need to start telling our own stories, not the ones written for us. Because although I don't want people to have main character syndrome or whatever the fuck that is, we are the protagonist of our lives. And also the antagonist. You know more of that later. But like, that is, you only see through this viewpoint. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't get to be based Colton and see exactly the way he sees the world, right? He can explain it to me. I can use psychology to help imagine what it would be like to see through his, but I never can because he's had his own beautiful, anecdotal, subjective life story. And like, if we're not getting down to that, like, I don't even know what we're talking about. Like, I'm a humanist. I'm here for humanity. Base Colton the Buddha said, we've turned our life experiences into a simulac sim simula simulacra of themselves. Oh, I'm going to have to look that word up. Hold on. Simula crop. I sounded out like a big girl, but I also know if I don't know how to <laughs> say it. Um, oh, yeah. Simula crop are copies and ooh, ooh. here, let me share. Let me share. Let's see. My good. My mic's still working. OK, cool is a 1981 philosophical uh, treatise by the philosopher and culture theorist Jean Bedrid, in which the author seeks to examine the relationships between reality symbols and society, in particular the sig sig um, significations and symbolism of culture and media involved in constructing and understanding a shared existence. Simulacra are copies that depict things that either had no origin or that no longer have an origin. Simulation is the, intim uh, the imitation of the operation of the real world process or system over time. Yes. Oh, thank you for putting that word in the chat. Yes, exactly this. Am I saying it right here? Let me, let me get it. Let me get a. Let me get it to sound it out for me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Learning on the live stream. Say it. Simulacrum. Okay, there we go. Simulacrum. 
Oh, wait, did, did you guys hear it? Or I have to add the desktop audio. Mm. Let's see yeah. if that worked. No, it didn't. Can you guys hear that? Let me know if you guys can hear that. Hmm. Try one other thing. I did not fix this before I came to do this live stream, so. Simulacrum. There we go. I think I got it. Simulacrum. Okay. Learning a new thing. Thank you for that. Yes, this is so right on. Okay. And um, base Colton Buddha. God, you're so based. I hope we get to meet each other in real life. We need to do a live stream and talk about this. <laughs> um, but yes, this is a great, I'm so glad to learn this word because this is, yes, it, it, kind of what I've been talking about. Um, copies that depict things that either had no origin or that no longer have an origin, right? Compare this to like, uh, again, I've been, I've been kind of describing the difference between like a stereotype and an archetype because people get really um, hung up on stereotypes, okay? And I would uh, like, I would connect that simulacrum of like things that cr are like created based on patterns but have no origin, right? Um, or no longer have an origin. Whereas like an archetype, okay? Um, is something that has is like an archetype is literally like the original form okay it's like if you made clones the archetype would be the prime right so a simulation is the in, uh, imitation of the operation of a real world process or system over time a simulation would be simulating right recreating prime archetypes and I'm emphasizing this because my personality philosophy is literally called prime archetypes. <laughs> like that's what it's called. Um, um, so we are definitely getting into this world where we've moved, we moved into simulation a little bit uh, through social media and a lot of this stuff. And we are getting into this world of simulac uh, simulacrum uh, or, where were copies that depict things that that really had no origin in the first place and don't really have any like foundation within humanity humanity's uh spirituality humanity's myth philosophy again for like 2000 10,000 years great thank you i love learning i love learning so much um, sorry, let me get back to the chat real quick. Uh, yes, yeah, so based the Colton Buddha taught us this new fucking word. Thank you. I love it. We're practicing the anarchy right now. Okay, there is no, <laughs> there is no hierarchy. Please get in the chat and teach me. Okay, I need to be taught things as well. I don't know everything. No, neither does anyone. And my search for knowledge will never end. I will always be a student. Like I said, I love learning. Um, Star uh, Collage says embracing authenticity. Yes. Base Golden Buddha says, you don't understand. We're only supposed to tell stories about how not flawed we are. Yeah. Yeah. We're only supposed to brag about ourselves. Yeah. Um, an imitation more or less. Yeah. Like a symbol, um, or signifier of itself. Yes. Heard it. Yes. Okay, cool. We're back. Um, Frog of Anarchist Production says, this is hitting at an interesting time. I've been especially hurt lately with some discussions around the tragedy of Brianna Gray. Like, I'm just, we could have been having a moment of sharing grief and love. Yes. Uh, I don't think, a lot, I, I don't think a lot of us really understand how intense of an emotion grief is. And how big it affects people, especially if you're grieving someone who is was very intimately part of your life. Grief can be 
personality changing, life changing. Um, and we don't talk about it enough or the steps of going through it or the fact that grief happens even when someone doesn't pass away, right? We always have space for people having grief after a breakup of a romantic relationship. We also don't give people that same space to have grief after a friendship is ended or any relationship, because we will go through that process for any relationship as well. So no, we don't allow a lot of space for that because a lot of people don't know how to support somebody in grief. What do I do? Do I, do I touch you? Do I give you, okay, I pat you on the head. <laughs> like I'm including myself in this, that like it's, I have to ask the person, tell me how I can be there for you instead of trying to assume or using what I maybe have used before or thought should work. I just ask, but that's very important. Um, and now people are engaging in spiteful anti-blackness and just no one's listening to each other. My sweeties are fighting and not listening. Yes. Oh, Frog of Anarchist Productions. I, I feel your pain. Okay. I've been having these conversations and frustrations uh, behind the scenes. We're going to talk about them more. Yes. It's not everyone, but enough that it hurts. Absolutely. Yes. Actual table uh, said they're going to lay down. I'm glad. I'm glad you stopped by too. And these streams will try to be a little bit earlier in the evening. Thank you for your um, contributions and get some, get some lovely sleep. Have some radical dreams. Go talk to the collective unconscious in your dreams and bring back us wisdom from your ancestors. Okay, let me just, I'm seeing if I'd, talking about anecdotes, stories, writing our own story. Yeah, okay, I got through everything I mentioned in my notes. And then we also learned this new word. Here, we'll put it up here again, just so everybody has the pronunciation. Simulacrum. 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 Sounds like something that I could make erotic. Come on over here and let me give you some simulacrum. Okay, I'm 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 ridiculous. <laughs> Let's get uh oh actual table said, okay, one lucid dream coming right up. Yes! Lucid dreams are a thing. Tesla thought of many advent uh many um inventions by lucid uh, dreaming and active imagining and um, Christopher Nolan also lucid dreams and active imagines. That's how he comes up with a lot of his movies. We will get into more, more of that in the future as well. Okay, the, I think the last thing I wanted to mention uh, about why we suck at conversations <laughs> and story is just a couple of questions that we want to remind ourselves of because there's a reason why we've lost this within society. Part of it is capitalism. Part of it is our jobs and work and everything like that. But part of it is also, did your parents tell you stories? Were you, did you get home from work or get home from work as a kid, get home from school as a child and have a parent there that was like, how did your day go? Tell me about your day or at least weekly. Did you read stories growing up? Did you have a parent read stories to you? Did your parents tell you stories about themselves and their childhood growing up? Do you know, do you know your parents' story? Really encourage people to see how much they know about their parents before they existed. Sometimes it's because parents don't want to tell us, but a lot of times it's because we've forgotten to ask. As a child, your parents, I believe, are supposed to, they're, they're responsible for preparing you for the world till about 21. I'm a big believer in the uh, seven life cycles um, kind of philosophy where we go through seasons of life by every seven years. So 21 would be three sevens. That's where, where in my anarchist community, I would think you would transition into adulthood. Once you're in adulthood, it is your responsibility as, as a child to 
take as much effort as a uh, like not as much, but take some effort to also get to know your parents. I bet you they have stories that they didn't think to share with you that you may want to ask about that might help you learn things that they didn't think was important that might help you be a better parent. If your parents are toxic or abusive, I'm not expecting this. <laughs> but if you have people in your in your life, like um, my fiance's mother is a great uh, kind of role model model for me. And I can go to her and ask those kind of questions. And I've heard she's told great stories. Um, my fiance's dad is has passed before I met him. And so through Alexander, my fiance and his mom telling me stories about his his dad, like I've gotten to know a little piece of this, uh, of, of who this man was and who this man was to the people that I now love in my life, which is important because that is part of them. And you learn that through stories. When we're talking about revolution, you need to know the story of the people that you are living in community with, the stories of that, because when you are coming to the brainstorming table on how to solve a problem, how to protect yourself, how to create dual power in a certain situations. By knowing those stories, when you're brainstorming, someone will remember, wait, didn't Fred tell us that he used to work for da 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 da? Remember Fred, when you were telling us that story? Didn't Susan tell us that they used to do da 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 da? A skill that people may have that they don't even know they have as a skill. But now we know because we sat around the campfire or we got together and had meetings, got to know each other, went for coffee afterwards and learned each other's story. Learned, got to know each other on an intimate level. Um, Frog of Anarchist Productions. Well, when you say it like that, I think he was responding to me talking about dreams um, and lucid dreaming. Frog uh, said, I definitely have pain around my parents, but they were always honest with me about their stories. I'm not unharmed in the world, but that's a gift I didn't know I got. Yeah. People would be surprised. Um, I had quite an abusive family situation growing up, but I did get read stories. Now, I don't know nothing about my parents' story, right? They wasn't sharing that. But I did grow up like um, being read like children's stories before I go to sleep at night, coming home from school and having a space to tell stories about where I was at at school or what I was did at school that day. Now, as I got older and like my identity and who I am started becoming more important, that became a little less and less. Um, but then I also had other people in my life that I was communicating with and telling stories. So, yeah, it's it's really important. Um, and also, like, it, it, you're right. It's a beautiful gift. Um, and that that's an interesting thing of healing as well, is that you have to go through your memories and you have to reorganize the traumatic ones with the good ones. Right? So... I have good memories of my narcissistic mother telling me stories, reading to me, being comforting. And I also have memories around those same things that are negative, right? And being able to go back through and being like, this is a beautiful memory. And this one isn't. And both those things can be true about this one human being that they gave me beautiful memories and also were abusive. Both those things can be true. And that's part of the healing process. Right? You can accept and love that your parents did their best. And you can also tell your parents it wasn't good enough. And that's okay. We live in capitalism. Even if your parents were perfect, it's almost impossible to not neglect kids in capitalism. It's kind of part of what capitalism is built on. It's going to be something I talk about a lot. Okay? We don't give a fuck about the kids. You want to talk about commodities? Commodities. 
never did get to see people's um, dimensions because of that. Yeah, yeah. It also it's also the the most painful having to accept such sources of joy that could still that joy could still hurt us. Yes. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, you almost want to reject the good. Yes. But here's the trick. This is why it sucks to repress our emotions. Because you can repress the sadness. You can repress anger. You can repress these things. But you also repress the other side of the spectrum. So if we repress sadness, it's very hard to feel joy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right? If I repress which I did and had been, and <laughs> there's still aspects I am still repressing as I am going through this process. But as I repressed trauma from my past, right, I, I also wasn't allowed the gift of those positive memories. And I want them because they're part of who I am. So I can repress those and have no, like, um no memory and be missing that aspect of who I am and my identity, or I can trudge through, you know, experience the emotion of, of, uh, of that trauma, work through it, and then also get to experience the joy from the other aspects of those, of those moments. It's a balance. It's not about one or the other. It's not about good or bad. It's, it's a balance. It's in this middle. It's realizing I am good. I am bad. I am the villain and I am the hero. We have capacity for everything. The more we become conscious of ourself and our actions and who we are and those archetypes and everything, the more we can make conscious decisions on when I want to be the villain or the hero. Oh my God, I am so mad at this fucking camera because this live stream replay is going to look stupid with me having to fucking, ah, sorry. I hate it when things don't work. <laughs> um, and I don't know why it's not working. Um, anyways, back to what I was saying. Uh, we have to accept the hero and the villain within us. The antagonist and the protagonist, right? The, the hero and the anti-hero. You have to understand that nobody is good and nobody is bad. And nobody uh, trying to be the goodest person, the bestest, most perfect good person, you are always going to fail. You should try to be whole. To try to be whole and balanced. I don't want to be good. I don't want people to be like, she was the goodest of good. I want to be whole. She was good. And sometimes she was a villain and she owned it. She knew it. Like now that I'm conscious of that thing and I accept that there's villain villainery in me when I do that and people are like, what the, what the fuck? I can own it. Nope. I knew that was villainous and I did it anyways. And here's why. And that's who I am. And I stand in it. And that is true self-individuation and enlightenment is, is getting to that place and getting the bad guy and the good guy and homostasis together. Um, it's easy to give in, yes, to wanting to reject the good with the traumatic, but ain't healthy. It's the true ending to uh, Billie Eilish. <laughs> you may be the bad guy, but you're also the good guy. Yes. No, uh, don't say I'm sorry, fro Frog. You're preaching. Vase, vase cold, Colton Buddha gave you, I think, is uh, testifying to your preaching. Yes, it is easy, easy to give in. And be the bad guy and the good guy. It's so much. It's a much more exciting life to live. OK, I loved when some of my friends got into their bad guy times, <laughs> like because sometimes you get to vicariously live through other people's like I'm having a bad guy moment. I'm saying I'm putting my foot down or like, you know, I'm drunk, but I want to fight this bitch. Right. And I'm like, oh, OK, and they're like, that's who I am. And I'm like, yes. Right. Or like whatever it is. Um, be that. Be you. Make mistakes. Learn. That's that's the point. Okay.
I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep going. This might it's gonna be a long live stream, but I'm gonna take some clips out because I've had many topics I wanted to talk about this this week. Um, I am going to do I think a quick break, and I'm gonna try to fix my camera because it's annoying the fuck out of me. So give me like five minutes, and I will be back, and we'll continue, and we will talk about. Tatu Betu, which is this uh, African queen that I'm going to read this article about. It's a really dope, fun story. And then we will finish with postmodernism. Yes, get some water, everybody. Get some water. Hit your bowl. We'll re-up. Take collective little break here. I've been going good for an hour and a half or so. And then we'll get into the next two topics. <laughs> Relax. Yes, take a dance break. Stretch. Move your neck. <laughs> I'll be back.
Okay, we're back. We're back. We are back. I think I think I have fixed it. I think I have fixed it. Oh yeah, uh that mid sleep water is for real, y'all. For real. Uh, I don't know if that means we're getting old. I don't know what that is. But yes, sometimes I have to wake up in the middle of the night and just drink half a gallon of water. <laughs> Maybe we're we're dehydrated when we go to sleep. I don't know. So important. So, all right. We are back. We are going to talk about postmodernism. Because I want to talk about this tonight and get this rant done with. <laughs> because this. Oh, sorry. Wrong thing. There we go. Because learning about postmodernism and the fact that this is something that I know a lot of people subscribe to I was like uh, very concerned um I did not I don't understand I just I lost my ever like logical fucking mind <laughs> trying to understand this so y'all um this is going to be the uh, non-politically correct ranty version of what the fuck is postmodernism and why are we doing this? And then I'm sure maybe in the future I will talk about it in a more intellectual way. Or maybe I won't. Maybe I'll decide that like, look, nah, y'all don't even, I'm done. <laughs> Who knows? But here we go. Okay. Uh, we will go through this together. Okay. Postmodernism. Mm -hmm. A Western philosophy, a late 20th century movement characterized by broad skepticism, uh, subject, subjectivism or relativism, a general suspicion of reason and an acute sensitivity to the role of ideology in asserting and maintaining political and economic power. Okay, what is that? What does that mean? Don't worry. We're going to come down here and they broke it down uh through eight points okay post oop, 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 sorry i do like to highlight i wish this highlight color was was um lighter though postmodernism is largely a reaction against the intellectual assumptions and values of the modern period in the history of western philosophy roughly the 17th through 19th century particularly Freud and Jung. Indeed, many of the doctrines characteristically associated with postmodernism can fairly be described as the straightforward denial of general philosophical viewpoints that were taken for granted during the 18th century Enlightenment, though they were not unique to that period. The most important of these viewpoints are the following. Here we go. There is an objective natural reality, a reality whose existence and properties are logically independent of human beings, of their minds, their societies, and their social practices, or their investigative techniques. Okay? I agree. Post 
postmodernists dismiss this idea as a kind of naive realism, okay? So they dismiss the idea of objective natural reality, okay? Because humans are so important, nothing would happen if we weren't experiencing reality <laughs> is kind of what that's saying, okay? That's just like a tree may fall in the woods, right? And people are like, does it make a sound if we don't hear it, right? It doesn't matter, it still fell, right? The objective reality is the tree fell, right? Whether we were here, like, whether we heard the sound or not, we know the tree fell, we can come back and see tree was standing, now it isn't falling, and it doesn't, there, there's no subjective viewpoint there, right? Right? I think, right? Okay. Postmodernists dismiss this idea, okay? Such reality as there is, according to postmodernists, is a conceptual, con construct, a conceptual construct, an artifact of scientific practice and language. So reality is basically like the consequence or the result of scientific practice and language. It's conceptual, it's abstract, okay? It's a social construct, reality. This point also applies to the investigation of past events by historians and to the description of social institutions, structures, or practices by social scientists. Which is interesting that we can also say there is no objective natural reality to history, right? There's no objective history. That is really convenient for the white people who created this philosophy when your colonizers who still haven't paid for all your colonization, right? That's really convenient to have a philosophy that investigates past events by historians as naive realism. And that we can change the scientific practice or language of that history and that changes the objective, there, because there is no objective reality, it changes the reality of that history. I guess it's subjective to, oh, fuck, I guess that's probably why we're having so many problems with, like, critical race theory and, like, wanting to rewrite history and saying that slavery uh, wasn't the reason for the Civil War. It just, it's convenient. Convenient. Right? So there is no objective natural reality, right? Which means there is only reality when human beings are experiencing it, I guess. And to think that there is reality going on outside of you and what you're experiencing would be naive realism. Uh, which to me is crazy and just sounds narcissistic, to be honest. It sounds like a raging narcissist. A philosophy for a raging narcissist to be like, I don't have to care about anybody's, anybody else. I don't have to care about objective reality. I don't care. I have to care about facts, history, anything I've done in the past. I don't have to care about other people's um, or be empathetic to how other people view or see the world because it's just an artifact of scientific practice and language. We're going to see a pattern here on this, okay? Number two. Um, hold on. Let me check the chat real quick. Um, to some extent, it makes sense to say that, at the very least, our understanding of reality of a construct, but the phenomenon itself acts independently of us. Yeah, I think there is an objective reality. How we are experiencing that objective reality is subjective to our experience, if that makes sense, right? But to say that your subjective experience is 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 the only reality and there's not an objective reality outside of that to me just screams the world didn't start worlding until i was born right like it it is there is actually oh man i'm gonna forget i'm gonna forget which book i have her written down in because i have so many fucking notebooks with notes but there is actually a philosophical or psychological word for this of um of the 
process that humans go through to understanding that other people are having their own unique experiences within the world and how that um how that how we grow as humans become more empathetic um as we get older as we are understanding that process that oh other people see the world differently than i do and that's okay <laughs> instead of being like ah, see it the way i do um okay number 2 the descriptive and explanatory statements of scientists and historians can, in principle, be objectively true or false. Okay, so descriptive and explanatory statements of scientists and historians, in principle, can be objectively true or false. Okay, they can also be subjectively true or false, but they can objectively be true. We, we have practices to view this. Okay, and I am also not like, a big person that just believes in like science. Like if we can't prove it by science, it's not real. I'm not that person. I'm somewhere in the middle, but we do have to acknowledge gravity is keeping me on the fucking earth right now. That's not in a, that, that's not a subjective truth. That is an objective truth that I'm sure you guys are also all experiencing right now. Gravity. Um, we can still call it a theory, but we, we prove the theory almost every day while existing. The postmodern denial of this viewpoint, which follows from the rejection of an objective natural reality, is sometimes expressed by saying that there is no such thing as truth. So by saying this, postmodernists can now say there is no truth. So everything can be true or false or right or wrong based on your subjective experience in this moment, right? Because they don't, like, history can be rewritten based on how you use words, based on the first principle, right? All of this is to make it so there is no truth, right? Which is, which is literally a strategy to psychologically control a society. If there is no objective truth, then we will argue and debate until we die in our chains. Um, okay. A tree may not make a sound, but it still makes compression waves. Okay, frog, come out here. Come out here and give us the, the knowledge. Because the presuppositions of an objective reality is itself a construct dependent on who is calling it so. But I may be misunderstanding the concept. So a tree falls, but do we understand if it, if we can't see it or hear it? Do we understand? No, we just don't know that it fell. We, under, we can understand how a tree falls, right? But if we weren't there, right, and we didn't hear it from far away, then... We just don't know about that piece of data. But I guarantee, like, the animals in the tree, if there was a bird in the tree, like, if there's a bear, like, in, like, in the woods, I, I'm sure they're experiencing that objective reality of the tree falling. Again, a, like, the world will continue to world. Plants will continue to grow, even if nothing is experiencing it in reality, especially humans, like, this planet, animals, this circle of life will continue to exist if there, even if there are not conscious beings experiencing reality. Right? Does that make sense? Um, yes, I would agree that a lot of postmodernists get a bit uh, pro-power about it, case by case, but many do. Yeah. Um, the quote was him basically talking about postmodern fascism. Ooh, frog. Uh... Maybe give me a little bit more context on what you were talking about, Frog. Um, the quote was him basically talking about postmodern fascism. fascism. Yeah. Um, and by the way, if you are a postmodernist, you are not going to like this rant because I don't. I, I think that this philosophy is a, is a big bag of nothingness. <laughs> um, I've already heard all of the um, strategies to get people to this exact thing they're talking about. So there is no truth. And it's it, there. Those strategies are used in cults. 
to control people. Uh, let me rephrase, capitalists controlling cults. There are actually positive cults and that's rooted, rooted in pagandry and that's a whole other thing. But the toxic type of cults that we talk about, like the, that is a, that concept, that philosophy is used to control people. Um, oh shoot, did the quote not send? Ooh, I don't know, maybe send it again just in case. Thank you. <laughs> All right, the next main principle, through the use of reason and logic and with the most specialized tools provided by science and technology, human beings are likely to change themselves and their societies for the better. It is reasonable to expect that future societies will be more humane, more just, more enlightened, and more prosperous than they are now. Um, postmodernists deny this enlightenment faith in science and technology as instruments of human progress. Now, this one's a little complicated because I don't believe, um, I don't subscribe to the concept that, uh, human beings are likely to change themselves and their societies for the better as we progress through time, right? There is this concept that like, well, we can... Um, say that slavery back then wasn't as bad. It wasn't inhumane. They didn't know, right? They, that morality had not meet, reached that, but we all know that that's a fucking lie. Okay. There are human beings that lived 250 years ago that are just as smart as human beings that made, that created computers. Right there. It is not inherent in society that we will progress forward with technology and enlightenment and science and like human evolution. Mm, we have, uh, we have absolutely like backtracked in evolution and in societies and morality, um, and morality like multiple times in our existence. So that's easy to prove is not true. Um, it is easy to prove it is not true if you don't believe in postmodernism, because the great thing about postmodernism is that, sorry, postmodernism is that they've made a philosophy that makes it impossible for you to argue with them <laughs> because they believe that how we use words changes the meaning of history of what we're like all these different things so I can't sit here and be like well here's objective history that proves that we don't um naturally evolve into more progressive like more enlightened people but they can just be like well I don't believe in that history <laughs> and you can't argue with them because it's their subjective experience of their subjective reality. And then their subjective reality, they can just be like, that history didn't happen. And you can't, you can't live in any sort of harmony or society with a philosophy like that. It's impossible. Like, I'm imagining it, it looks like, again, a society of raging narcissists, because that's what that's saying. My subjective life experience in reality is a priority and it's how I'm viewing the world. And I have no capacity to have empathy towards other perspectives. That's what it sounds like to me. We're going to, I'm going to keep going through this, but that's what this sounds like. Uh, and the people that are named as, as creating this philosophy are wealthy white people that are, have college degrees. They're, they're very wealthy. I just want to emphasize that, okay? They're not pro like they're not the average proletariat. Okay, postmodernists deny this enlightenment faith in science and technology as instruments of human progress. So, postmodernists deny that we can show human progress through science and technology. I don't dis I don't disagree with that viewpoint, but I don't agree with it in the way that postmodernists do. Indeed, most postmodernists hold that the misguided or unguided pursuit of scientific and technolo technological knowledge led to the development of technologies for killing on massive scale in World War II. Some go so far as to say that science and technology, in even reason and logic, are inherently destructive and oppressive. 
because they have been used by evil people, especially during the 20th century, to destroy and oppress others. So because technology has been created and used to oppress people, that means all technology is bad, right? There's no other way to use technology in forms that don't oppress people, right? Now, this is not all postmodernists that believe this. It seems like this may be a more, I don't know. Again, I don't, I don't know. Y'all let me know in the comments or whatever, but in the chat, I think this might be a little bit more of a minority of a belief. Um, but it's still insane. <laughs> like, it's still kind of like, it's just hard to map my brain around the idea that science, technology, and even reason and logic are inherently destructive and oppressive. Like, it's really hard because I'm an INTJ personality type, right? Personality archetype. Um, which in my like personality system would be again, like the producer of knowing how to create environments within humanity. That's like my role in society, right? The, the architect and strategist of that thing, right? Based on complete reason and logic, like that is the function I'm literally using right now as I'm ranting about this, that I communicate in, extroverted thinking, okay? Other people's reason and logic. And they are basically telling me that inherently who I am is destructive and oppressive because I'm a thinker. Thinker feelers within the personality spectrum, okay? If you have T as a dominant top two function, you are a thinker. They're basically saying that we are inherently destructive and oppressive because that's inherently our archetype as a person. Like, I can't think of things without going through the reason and logic. That is my core prime programming, okay? So I don't know, again, how you organize a society without reason and logic. Like, I don't know how, how postmodernists write books about postmodernism without being an absolute hypocrite because you would have to use reason and logic to go through the process of how to publish a book. Like, how do they exist every day without using reason and logic? Well, it'd have to be hypocritical because every fucking tool we use in life was created by people who use reason and logic to create it. Right. If postmodernists are like, well, you know what? I don't want to go to the store right now because it's pouring down rain. I'll go when the weather's better. Well, that's reason and logic. So you better not go to the store because you don't feel like it. But don't you better don't you fucking use reason and logic to make decisions because this is apparently your core philosophy. Let's go to number four. Let me check the chat real quick. Um, here we go. Yeah. With postmodern philosophy, there's a lot of dodging around atrocity. Like there wasn't a choice made. Yeah. Like, even if they believe it happened, they may not think it was wrong. Yeah. Cause again, it's subjective to their own personal experience. Postmodernists are, uh, let's see, are usually the ones saying colonization, the horrors of the Columbian exchange era were inevitable. Mm. Uh, easily mappable to nihilist framework. Exactly. That's exactly what it sounds like. A lot of nihilism. I'm healing from nihilism, so I recognize this quite a bit. Yeah, it's an old friend, if you will. Friend is maybe not the best word, but it's dark as fuck. Yeah, I get, I mean, I empathize. I understand nihilism. Um, I understand how we get there, and I understand that it's easy to get there in the society we live in because we're not giving much hope or action. And a lot of people don't have much purpose. Again, we are constantly wanting to be good, wanting to be accepted, wanting to be seen, wanting to spout our identities, but nobody's worried about being whole. Right? Nobody's worried. There's a couple great videos on YouTube that are like, you shouldn't try to be good. You should try to be whole and have purpose. <laughs> right? Nihilism is overcoming everyone because they have no fucking purpose. You are just waking up every day to go through your loop again 
and your purpose is non-existent. I do this job so that I can put a roof over my head that I shouldn't have to pay for, right? Society is slowly breaking, not even breaking down, but becoming more controlling and people are suffering all around me all the time, but I have no power to do anything. People are dying left and right. I'm empathetic and I care and it breaks my heart and I'm feeling, but I can't do anything. Like, I don't have a purpose. I don't have, I'm not, nothing I'm doing matters or means anything. Um, I don't have a, I don't have a job in which somebody comes to me once a week to be like how purposeful what I'm doing is affecting like the world or somebody in a, in a personal level. If you have no purpose, nihilism is going to seem like a great concept. And that is, uh, something we are suffering from in society collectively is a society that is over identifying with identity and people don't have purpose. Um, yeah, you can see a trend with postmodernists shifting toward a more nihilistic perspective heading into the seventies. Yeah. Went from here's how society sees the world. Here's why you should do nothing about it. That's a lot of do nothing about it. It seems like a philosophy to make you very comfortable with doing nothing about it. Okay. Uh, number four, reason and logic are universally valid. Their laws are the same for or apply equally to any thinker and any domain of knowledge. I agree with that. Um, <laughs> uh, I think we've seen that that's true. For postmodernists, reason and logic are two, um, reason and logic, two are merely conceptual constructs and are therefore valid only within the established intellectual traditions in which they are used. Meaning reason and logic the reason and logic for like this specific situation is fine. But if we use reason and logic to reason and logic, another situation or make a connection to something else invalid, not a thing. Right. But it's kind of the point of reason and logic, right? If this is this and this is this, then this is this. Right. They say, nah, that you can pick and choose what reason and logic works for you in that situation. Oh, that seems convenient. Number five. Oh man, this weekend when me and my fiance went through this, I went off. It took us like three hours. No, I'm not joking. Three hours to get through this, like these eight little things that I'm showing you because my brain broke. <laughs> like my brain, I'm like, what? But how do you like, and I couldn't stop making jokes about it all weekend where I was like, well, you know what? I didn't even do, just pretend I didn't do that because I'm a postmodernist and I believe that it didn't happen because it I don't remember it in my subjective viewpoint. I went off, uh, like I was, it was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot because I could not fathom that this is the philosophy that I had seen some of the people that I follow on YouTube. Like this can't be what you're talking about, right? There's got to be another... <laughs> It's got to be another postmodernism out there. Is there another viewpoint? This cannot be what you guys have been bringing up in your video essays. I hope not. It's concerning. Okay, number five. There is such a thing as human nature. It consists of faculties, apt aptitudes, or dispositions that are in some sense present in human beings at birth rather than learned or instilled through social forces. Postmodernists insist that all or nearly all aspects of human psychology are completely socially determined. Wrong. <laughs> it's just wrong. There has been many books. You can prove this. Psychologists have proved this. Neurologists have proved this. Plus there's evidence that you can see in your own existence within your family to prove that there are genetic and biological and probably spiritual soul things that are passed down through humans through time right that are like you know what a mother is when you're two months old three months old four months old you've you don't like no you don't know english no one's taught you how to speak but in your, in your viewpoint of the world, you like, that's mom. That's where I'm safe, right? That understanding is inherent, is innate, 
right? It's passed down. It's an archetype, to be honest, right? And it, they're necessary to understand what we are experiencing uh, as humans, right? To make sure that our desires lead us towards social community bonds so the species fucking survives. If this is how people lived, humanity wouldn't exist. <laughs> like, good Lord, we wouldn't have made it through, I don't know, through the 1200s, let alone fucking Nazi Germany. Like, you know what I'm saying? It doesn't work. Like, it is, it is so arrogant of humankind to think that we are smarter than the thing that created us. Okay? Evolution in the universe created us, right? I know some people like to be like, there's a Lord Jesus Christ that created us. Whatever, I'm not here for you people. I don't even know why you're on my channel. Um, <laughs> right? But like, biologically, evolutionary-wise, okay? We were created by the universe, right? Through lots of mistakes, by the way. There's a lot of mistakes that created us. In what world? 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 In what world would I think that I, the created, could understand the creator? Doesn't matter how many of our brains we put together. I think it is inherent within Christianity and religions that said that, you know, man has dominion over uh, animal and of the land. I think it's a misconception to think that somehow our brains, which were created by these theories, systems, and structures, in which we still do not completely fucking understand how they work, can somehow outthink evolution, biology, and nature. Human nature. I think highly of myself. I don't think that highly of myself or the rest of human species. I think we need a fucking wake up call that we're really not that fucking brilliant. <laughs> like, <laughs> especially individually, right? We can do some brilliant things together, but like, we need a wake up call. Guys, this is all rooted in Christianity and religion. Um, Base Colton Buddha says, Jordan Peterson comes to mind as the man who practices postmodern thought despite saying it sucks. Yeah. Yo, he does. I would agree. Yeah. He'd be changing reality all the time. Bless his heart. I still have a, I have a little soft spot for Jordan Peterson though, because um, he is one of the few philosophers that is not ashamed to talk about Yoon. Right? Like, there's so many psychologists and philosophers that when I'm hearing them talk, I'm like, oh, well, that's uni and psychology. Oh, you got that from Freud, right? But if you bring it up, they'll deny it. Like you've accused them of sex, like just, ah, oh, I'm not, I'm, not, it's not you, da, da, da. And I'm like, but it is, like the, but it is. Right? I know you can't source them anymore. I don't know. This is like this whole postmodernism is a reaction to a lot of the knowledge that we got from people like Freud and Yoon and Einstein and lots of other fucking philosophers and psychologists from the first 50 years of the 1900s. Um Oh my god, you read my brain, Buddha. Yeah. Instantly, that motherfucker came to mind. Yes. Well, you have, you, well, you'd have been cool with it if you were there. <laughs> yeah, it depends on which history you're talking about. There's lots of things I wouldn't be, wouldn't have been cool with. Um, his obvious soul sickness reeks of postmodernism. Yeah. Is there another time and place? Do you think Jordan uh, is a, com Jordan's a comrade? Yeah, I think Jordan needs some love. I think Jordan needs a hug. He's like, what do you think he is? You know, like his voice sounds like, oh, you haven't been loved in such a long time. <laughs> um, lots of people, I think he's I'm trying to remember, because I think I had watched some stuff where people think that Jordan Peterson is a 
INTJ. That was one reason why I did some research on him in the beginning, because I was like, oh, really? Um, and he was interested in Yoon. But I think people have moved. Oh, man, this is bad. This website is bad. Even though I use it sometimes for personality stuff, they're almost always wrong. Um, and he's definitely not an INFJ. Um, <laughs> but it's crazy. Uh, but INTP, I think, is accurate. So I empathize a little bit because we have similar reversed functions. And like I think sometimes people go too hard on Jordan Peterson, to be honest, where I'm like, you know, like, why are we, why, like, half of society is being like, men need to get in touch with their emotions, you know, they need to express themselves better. And then Jordan Peterson cries, and people are like, not like that, not like that, not men on the right, ah, make fun of him. And, like, I have to swallow that, because, like, again, a lot of leftists love to come at him. Like, I love Behind the Bastards. They do, they've done multiple episodes on him because they just like to make fun of him. And I struggle with it because a lot of the things they make fun of him about is Yoon's psychology. <laughs> like, and I'm like, well, he's not that far off on that stuff. He just is willing to admit it out loud. Um, and there are um, a lot of people who are not. Um, so in another time or place, do you think Jordan's a comrade? Uh, I think in, I think anyone can be a comrade in the future. I think he makes too much money though. I mean, he's pretty much part of the elite, right? Or at least the. Um, petty bourgeoisie. I haven't practiced my, um, my Jordan Peterson voice. I need to work that. Well, what do you see is? What we see is the abstract archetype of Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> Gotta be higher. I have such a low voice. It's like it's like in the back, right? Um, his takes on 1984 are dog shit. <laughs> yeah, I mean his takes on a lot of things are dog shit. I'll admit. Yeah, he seems lost to me. Sorry, guys. To be honest, that's maybe why I empathize a little bit is like he seems lost in his own abstract loop of ideas. Like he hasn't been back to reality in a long time. I think that's why I empathize. I don't know if any of you guys watch Westworld. There was a thing called the sublime. Yeah, it seems like he had been in the sublime for a very long time and has forgotten to come back to reality. And so when he does, we're like, what the fuck are you talking about? Because he's just in his, in his head with all of his abstract ideas. Um, oh, for sure. And that has a lot to do with reconciling his affinity for a leftist creator. Yeah, like Orwell, yet ascribing to the right. So he's trying to find meaning. Yep, without changing the framework. Yep, big Joel discussed him in context of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. And yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Uh, Poignant what you're saying. So he's trying to find meaning without changing the framework. It's so true. And that's what I see as I see a lost soul trying to find meaning in their life. Right. And as an INTJ, my first function is meaning, is purpose, meaning, intuition. Right. And so I empathize. Okay. There's, I have a part of my own uh, depression that I've gone through in life is living in a world that there is no purpose or meaning to so many things. It eats me up. It fucking, it's hard to exist in that world because my, my first two functions are purpose and effective stra uh, strategical logic. <laughs> um, so yeah, I feel that. Okay. Language, uh, number six, I'm going to try to get these through these. Language refers to and represents a reality outside itself. According to postmodernists, language is not such a mirror of nature as the American prag um, pragmatist philosopher Richard Rorty characterized the Enlightenment view, inspired by the works of the Swiss linguist uh, hmm, Ferdinand de Soissou. I don't know exactly how to pronounce that. Um, postmodernist claim that language is semantical. Oh, sorry, is um, semantical, semantically? Yes, semantically self-contained or self-referential. The meaning of a word is not a static thing. 
in the world or even an idea in the mind, but rather a range of contrast and differences with the meanings of other words. Because meanings are in the sense functions of other meanings, which themselves are functions of other meanings and so on, they are nev never fully present to the speaker or hearer, but are endlessly deferred. That was a big mouthful of nothing, <laughs> okay? It's basically saying meaning is subjective, the meaning to words is subjective in the moment and are based on other words around them and not a set meaning that we have decided on as a society. And again, society will not work if we do not have shared meanings for words, okay? One of the first basics of like relearning how to communicate better in, my, in classes I've, um, I've taught and curriculums I've created, the foundation is rooted in defining terminology, right? Defining terminology, right? What does that word mean to you? Right? And it's not, I, I used to say it like that because I use this very much like in kink negotiations, but I say it like that not because we have different subjective meanings for words, but because we do have subjective life experiences, right? And some words we learn because of the context around the word, but we have never actually looked the word up to see what that word means. We've heard the word used over and over and over again, right? Revolution. We've heard people use revolution over and over and over again in movies around the context of these things. And so we figured out that revolution means this, but we've not actually gone and look it up in the dictionary to know exactly what it means, right? And we would be surprised how much we are being that, that you can be gaslit and slightly brainwashed by not having actual understandings of what words mean, okay? This is how narcissists gaslight you, by changing the meaning of words, right? Ron DeSantos, he goes, I didn't say I was Jewish. I said I was Jew-ish. Perfect example. That's called gaslighting. It's not called postmodernism. <laughs> oh, I guess it is, but it's also called gaslighting. Okay. After we just read that mouthful of uh, BS, um, self-reference characteri self -reference characterizes not only natural languages, but also the more specialized discourses of particular communities or traditions. Such discourse are embedded in social practices and reflect the conceptual schemes and morale and intellectual values of the community or tradition in which they are used. The postmodern view of language and discourse is due largely to the French philosopher, fuck French, and literary theorist Jacques Derrida, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, the originator and leading practitioner of deconstruction. So this is, again, like this sentence right here to me says a lot about why this philosophy was created and how much it's connected and not having to take a responsibility <laughs> for 500 years of colonization, right? Self-reference characterizations, not only, not only natural languages, but also the more specialized discourses of particular communities or traditions, we'll use black people and Black Lives Matters in this point. Such discourses are embedded in social practices and reflect the conceptual schemes and morale and intellectual values of that community or tradition in which they are, they are used, right? They are used, right? But we're not using slavery as a discourse, right? It, it, it happened objectively. Again, that doesn't matter to postmodernists because they don't believe in objective reality, right? So it again goes back to like being impossible to argue, right? Which I don't want to argue with a postmodernist, to be honest, because it would be so frustrating. But that's, that's what this is saying, right? Is like, well, that's just culture. There's not in institutionalized racism. That's just culture. 
Hmm, who says that, Ben Shapiro? Um, let's see. Let me go back to the chat real quick. Um, like, don't get me wrong. I'm allied with marginalized sweeties, so I know who not to trust, but I can empathize and not trust at the same time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So is postmodernism just neoliberalism? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, let me write that down. Is postmodernism... <laughs> Maybe that's the video that I, I do for the video essay. Is postmodernism just neoliberalism? You might be onto something there. I'm gonna put your username so I don't forget that you are the one who gave me this idea. Because you might be right, and that might be the video essay I have to do about this topic. Okay, he's like, uh, he continues, like, it all tracks. This weird paradoxal rejection of reality, yet self-branding as pragmatic. Yep. Who does that sound like? Vosh. Um, mis uh, misanthropic view of humanity while maintaining belief in social conditioning for the purpose of controlling us. Abstract nihilism underpinning everything. Yep, yep, yep. Also, where uh, dog whistles are used. Yep. Um, it all tracks. Yeah, uh, oxymorons, political corruptions of language, it all tracks. If this framework of thought is seeping its way into the nebulous left, I'm scared. It's been being taught in uh, our college institutions for over 50 years. <laughs> Someone said, you the French. <laughs> I'm only saying that because the French don't have a good track record when it comes to their philosophers. That's no hate on the French. No shade, okay? I love French culture. <laughs> so there's, um, let's see. To the postmodernist, anything can be debated. There is a moral argument for everything. Yeah, and there's not, Vosh. Um, and somehow it's all correct. Yes, Vosh. So there's a contradiction, but we just accept both conflicting ideas. Yep, Vosh. Uh, really fits in through, doesn't, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Exactly that. Okay, number seven. Human beings can acquire knowledge about natural reality, and this knowledge can be justified ultimately on the basis of evidence or principles that are or can be known immediately, intuitively or otherwise with certainty. Okay? Yes, I agree with that. Postmodernists reject philosophical <laughs> foundationalism. The attempt perhaps best exemplified by the 17th century French philosopher René Descartes um, dictum uh, cogito ergo sum. I think that's supposed to be Latin. I think therefore I am. To identify a foundation of certainty on which to build the edifice of empirical knowledge. So this is kind of taking a perverted viewpoint of the concept, I think, therefore I am, right? This That has more to do with, um, not more to do with, but like, they're perverting it, right? They're saying, whatever I think is what is objective, right? like, is what is reality, right? Um, oh, God, it's just... And it's perverting such a great fucking quote, right? I think therefore I am is rooted in can be is rooted in some philosophy that like can be taken from a, a you know a very productive like perspective that can help growth, right? But so much of this stuff gets perverted. Hold on, let me look at this real quick. So I'm trying to remember. Yeah, this is about the statement. Latin, I think, therefore I am. Uh, dictum coined by the French philosopher René Descartes in his discourse on method as a first step in demonstrating the attainability of certain knowledge. It is the only statement to survive the test of his methodical doubt. The statement is indubitably, as Descartes argued in the second of his six meditations on first philosophy, because even if an all-powerful demon were to try to deceive him into thinking that he exists when he does not, he would have to exist in order for the demon to deceive him. 
Okay. Notice how we used a story. We used a story allegory to describe a concept. Sorry, that was just from earlier and stories are important. Okay. Um, <laughs> just so to break that down so people kind of understand that concept, right? Um, but I think this is, I think postmodernists are kind of perverting what this means or how it can be used, right? And they have to, because what we just talked about, right, what he's explaining is logic. Logic, right? They don't believe in that. Okay, number eight, and then we will wrap this live stream up. Um, let's see. Um, Frog of Anarchist Productions. I'm actually kind of terrified. I am similar in that I am constantly searching for meaning in life as my primary motivator. And I feel those type of folks are especially susceptible in societal collapse to this, like borderline love, crafty and horror of the mind, um, mind, beauty and intellect. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um. A large percentage of the population, the function that gives you meaning and purpose is like at the bottom of your stack of your person of your cognitive functions. It's sixth, seventh, or eighth. And this is why nihilistic concepts and philosophies like this uh, are more likely to take off in society because we have a certain portion of the population that needs community and needs other people to guide them and helping them find their individual purpose. We don't create those spaces, right? Um, and oftentimes our purpose was already programmed into us by our parents and whatever trauma we might have experienced in that situation that holds us back. from actually fulfilling our own purpose. You can't fulfill your own purpose too if you don't, if you haven't connected with your own identity, right? If you are still performing the identity, the story that your parents gave you, right? Or or treat people that the, the people who have traumatized in your life gave you, it's really hard <laughs> like to not, like if you don't know you and you the main character, how do you write you story? You don't. The story is gets written by other people. And part of healing, part of the ne like necessary step before any sort of huge revolution can happen is individual healing, Indivi like individuals stop, a, a, for individuals to stop identifying with complexes, unconscious complexes that are lashing out at people, right? And neurosis and actually own themselves, get to know themselves, acknowledge that they have a good and the bad, right? And that they're just trying to be whole. If your purpose of life is to be whole, well, there's a lot of fucking, there's endless opportunities for what that means for you, right? Being whole for you might look like a career in education and helping children. Being whole for you might be being a writer, right? Um, and I'm not saying these as career paths. I'm saying these as passions. Because again, I'm an anarchist. So I hope we can get to a society where you can just do this thing because you're passionate about it, not because you have to make money. And that's one reason why most of us don't like, why a large percentage of people in the society feel like they have no purpose. Because you're supposed to find purpose and meaning in Finding yourself and then picking the passion that you are. Pa I'm passionate about woodworking. I'm passionate about being a janitor. I'm passionate about helping people, cooking, whatever else. And instead of having to have a capitalist job that maybe doesn't do any of that, right? And now these passions are hobbies, right? Your community would say, are you passionate about making bread? Well, make bread then. You make bread. You're the best at making bread. You're going to make all the bread, right? And all the rest of the needs that the community that you that person needs is provided for them because they make the community the best fucking bread. 
and they love it and they're passionate about it. And guess what? They teach new generations all their recipes on how to make the best bread. And then we make net, like, then that information and data gets passed down to the next generation and added to and evolved and created more on. And like, that's how we create um, generational like knowledge and wisdom and how we pass down cultures to the, to the future. It's how we get remembered, right? Is that, that, that person that's the bread person in your community, 150 years from now, her recipe may still exist in this reality. And they, they, people will still say her great, great, great grandchildren will be like, this is my great, 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 great grandmother's bread recipe. And it's kept this community alive for 150 years. Um, it's a strange subject because I don't see how both can't be true for postmodernists. We can be shaped by both nature and nurture. We are social creatures, products of the world, but a part of it. Um, ah, but you see that that's the kicker, Buddha. You're attempting to apply logic to them. Exactly. But if we're being honest, this isn't a framework born of logic whatsoever. It's reactionary philosophy. Contradictions arise as needed. Exactly. And that's the, it, that's the exact problem is that like you need to use something that they don't believe in to try to advocate that this is not right. Right. And if that, if this does not work. And if that's true, like that, that should be enough proof that the postmodernist philosophy is a bunch of bullshit. Like, it's crazy to think that like, I had an abstract idea of what this is, but like this philosophy has been existing for 50 to 70 years almost, I think. Um, it came after, um, you know, a lot of the early 1900s philosophers passed away in the 50s, right? And then postmodernism started building stream then. And, like, I do feel a little bad that, like, I I got deep into it for, like, three hours and was like, well, throw this out with the bathwater. <laughs> um, because I'm sure people will be like, well, who the fuck are you? Well, who the fuck are you? Why don't you have letters behind your name to say that this isn't a thing? People with lots of letters behind their name said this is a thing and I have no problem being like it's not it's stupid it's made up it's an abstract reality that's going to cause you to cause more harm in the world and cause more disharmony and probably more violence now I do also think that a lot of people uh, like are using the terminology postmodernism and don't under like maybe don't have this like they have a different meaning for what postmodernism is because they're postmodernist <laughs> and you can just make up definitions to words whenever you want. So nobody knows what the fuck anyone is talking about. You see how it kind of just constantly goes around in a circle and then doesn't go anywhere. Okay. Number eight, uh, we'll read this and then we'll do the last bit of comments. It is possible, at least in principle, to construct general theories that explain many aspects of the natural or social world within a given domain of knowledge. Uh, a general theory of human history, such as dialectic materialism. A core concept in philosophy if you are a leftist. Furthermore, it should be a goal of scientific and historical research to construct such theories even if they are never perfectly attainable in practice. Postmodernists dismiss this notion as a pipe dream and indeed as a symptomatic, um, yeah, symptomatic of, am I saying that right? Symptomatic, yeah, of an, uh, indeed as symptomatic of an unhealthy tendency with enlightenment discourses to adopt totalizing systems of thought. As the French philosopher Emmanuel Levinas um, <laughs> called them, or grand meta narratives, or human biology, of, sorry, meta narratives of human um, biological, historical, and social development, as the French philosopher Jean Francois Lotard claimed. These theories are pernicious, not merely because they are false, but because they effectively impose conformity on other perspectives of, or discourse, thereby oppressing, marginalized, or silencing them. Derrida himself equated that um, equated the theor theoretical tendency toward totality with totalitarianism. I hate that word. 
I always have to sound it out. Um, <laughs> there's just too many ta 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 da la la. Um, so basically, what this is saying is that there shouldn't be any to uh, totalizing systems of thought, right? It, it basically, like postmodernism argues the destruction of philosophy as a concept, right? So they dismiss this notion that uh, of dialectic materialism or like the goal of science uh, of science or progression to better things as a pipe dream. OK, indeed, a uh, symptomatic of unhealthy tendencies with enlightenment. So a symptom of having unhealthy tendencies with enlightenment discourse. Right. To adopt totalizing systems of thought. Right. I agree that we shouldn't maybe adopt totalizing systems of thought. I don't think that I find one system and adopt totalizing systems of thought. I'm very much someone that finds eight systems and says, well, maybe we should use good things from all of these. Based on what works, based off on some objective reality. Um, so totalizing systems of thought or grand meta narratives of human biology, his, uh, bi sorry, of human biological, historical and social development. Meta narratives. So basically like not real narratives. <laughs> Let me see. I, what does that mean? Meta narratives. We love to work, we'll look up a word. Okay. Meta narrative, a narrative which con concerns narratives of historical meaning, experience, or knowledge, and offers le um, legitimation of such through the anticipated completion of some master idea, a grand story that is self legitimizing. Hmm, interesting. Uh, meta is Greek for beyond. Narrative is a story that is characterized by its telling. Um, so beyond story. Okay. Da, da, da. There's a guy with his claim that the postmodern was characterized precisely by a mistrust of the grand narratives, progress, enlightenment, emancipation, Marxism that had formed an essential part of modernity. Okay, so yeah, he literally term like coined this cra this phrase to say that uh, postmodernism uh, has a mistrust in grand narratives like progress, enlightenment, like emancipation, um, and Marxism. So again, I don't know how you can be a leftist, a Marxist, um, an anarchist, a communist, a socialist. And subscribe to this when this philosophy was literally created to mis to, to create mistrust in the these other grand narratives of philosophy. Um, Latoy proposed that meta narratives should give way to petite receipts, recites, or more modest and local localized narratives, which can throw off the grand narrative by bringing into focus the singular event. Borrowing from works of uh, Wittgenstein and his theory of the models of discourse, Letard constructs his vision of a progressive uh, of progressive politics grounded in cohabitation of a whole range of diverse and always locally legitimated language games. The fuck language games is a, philo a philosophical concept developed by Ludwig. Uh, Wittgenstein, referring to simple examples of language use and actions into which language is woven, argued that a word or even a sentence has meaning only as the result of the rule. Okay. Postmodernists attempt to replace meta narratives by focusing on specific local contexts as well as the diversity of human experience. They argue for the existence of multiplicity of theoretical standpoints rather than for grand, all encompassing theories. Okay, I don't agree with that. 
when it comes to philosophy. I think that philosophy is the one thing where you can have not all encompassing, but very much encompassing narratives, right? Uh, Marxism explains explains a lot of what capitalism is, but it doesn't explain it to all the nuance of what it is now in 2023, right? We would need to put in the um, the sensory updated data of the current time, right? Your material conditions, right? Marx literally talked about this. That would change what those dialect, what that dialectic materialism looks like. Replacing that narrative with each individual's subjective experience on this more specific local context literally is just going to create mayhem where there can be no agreement on what a word means, on what our history is. And if this is where we're going, well, then I would also like to rewrite history. Right? I'm going to let white people know that they are not superior. And we have always been, oh, wait, I don't have to rewrite history. But, like, do you see how, like, you can then just create what, like, we do create reality. Our words and language are powerful, right? These, But they are meant to bring us together, not in conflict, right? And all of this sounds like what we literally talk about when I talk about communication and miscommunication, right? I can't imagine everyone having their own individual philosophy and their own individual meaning for every word in the English language. I don't know how the fuck we're going to communicate or organize or have any sort of functioning society. Especially because we're not doing any logic either. So let's see. Um, hmm. These theories are pernicious, not merely because they are false, but because they effectively impose conformity on other perspectives of, of discourse, right? So He's saying that these meta narratives like dialectic materialism and uh oops sorry where did that go uh like enlightenment and emancipation right those are meta narratives okay these theories are pernicious not merely because they are false they're pernicious people hold on let me see let me get the exact meaning for that Highly injurious and destructive, deadly. They're wicked narratives, okay? These narratives are wicked, not merely because they are not true, right, false, but because they effectively impose conformity on other perspectives of discourse, right? So it says, well, people who don't think slavery happened get forced or oppressed to believe that slavery happened because it is one of those meta narratives, right? And those things are pernicious and false. But in saying they're pernicious and false, you are taking a stance in which that is not what you were supposed to do as someone who is a postmodernist. But the stance is I'm being oppressed, right? As this white person or this person of status, I'm being oppressed by your meta narrative that slavery was a thing. What does that sound like? Well, it sounds like all the Trumpers that have been screaming about critical race theory and reverse racism. That's what it sounds like. So, to me, postmodernism can Suck my big old anarchist dick. And if you're a postmodernist and you don't like that, just pretend I didn't say it in your reality. And we'll be fine. Just pretend I didn't say it. Okay? But that's some bullshit. That don't make no goddamn fucking sense. Any of that shit. Okay, I'm going to read through a few more comments. And then, what time is it? 
fuck it. Yep, we're going to do all the stories I had planned, <laughs> even though they're taking a little bit longer than I had planned them to take. Uh, we were going to do this last story about this amazing um, queen, but let me look at the comments really quick. Mm. It's a sad, desperate reaction to um, global collapse by attempting to control a world and the people they fundamentally despise. This is like soul sickness personified facts. Yep. Base Colton said conformity. If it's elucidated, then it's evil. Facts. Wow. Yep. Frog said diversity of thought versus destruction of thought. Whew. Say that. This reads like rejection of people. Yes. When they say, uh, Base Colton, when they say totalized, they probably mean saying that contradiction and, ch and change are not part of historical, social, and natural development. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the type, the type to load their brains into a computer. <gasps> yeah. Good Lord. I could not load my brain into a computer. I think I'm pretty intelligent and I pride myself in being intellectual and my brain and being able to strategize and abstract concepts and theories. But I like being a human in a body that can experience reality hot, cold, the sun, sand, and my toes, right? The joyous wonder on a child's face. Like, I like being able to experience those and not being in a computer. <laughs> um, let's see. The whole history is written by the Victor concept. Woo, yep. Yep. Okay, so keep an eye out on fellow anarchists because I'm worried now. I feel there are folks who are vulnerable to that. Yeah, and we got to love them before we lose them. Whew. Frog, I love the way you talk about love. We got to love them before we lose them. It's so true. We have to. Yeah, that that one. Um, yeah, that's one that needs more investigation. Need to get my um, Boldred on. Boldred? Let's see what that. Hold on. Let me look that up. Look, I am someone who, I, I have no shame. If I don't know something, I look it up. If I don't know a word, oh yes, Jean. Jean uh, Boldred was a French sociologist, philosopher, and poet with interest in cultural studies. He is best known for his analysis of media, contemporary culture, and technology communications, as well as his formulation of concepts such as hyper-reality. Oh yes, he is great, because I, I love that... Um, um, concept of hyperreality. And it looks like he also was talking about the su simulacrum that and simulation that we were looking at earlier. Interesting. Okay. Great chat. I don't know about postmodernism before and oof, I'm wary of it now. Oh, thank you. Thank you for watching, Joe. Uh, yeah, Base Colton was a Marxist, but postmodern thought. Okay. Um, I do, I, I do think, uh, this concept about how hyper reality is uh, really poignant to right now. I've watched a couple of videos on YouTube about that concept, but I will have to also get my Jean Belgique on. Um, to be honest, I feel like I got lucky because my fiance was already so my, my fiance is like, been doing this for 30 fucking years and is already like he was interested in this stuff right as 18 so he's already like studied and read so many different books and we do a lot of this work together and I love I think by his guidance and help and then also probably my intuition I feel like I very uh quickly found my foundation of philosophy in Yoon and Plato and um I know people will not think of Einstein as a uh, Einstein as a philosopher, but he was. Um, and I feel like I got lucky <laughs> to like. Um, I feel like I got lucky to maybe have walked into some of the um, more grounded philosophy because my fiance has already done a lot of this research, right? And I I value his opinion and we have similar value systems because now I feel like a lot of the research I end up doing is on people who don't subscribe or, or people who are, are postmodernists or have other viewpoints 
And I like, and that's how I'm finding out about people is when I'm like, oh, why don't they think that this is right? Why did they disagree with this? Um, and I find that really interesting and also fun. Like, again, I love learning. This has been, this is like, this is like being an explorer, like back in the day, but like in my mind, <laughs> like in the mind's eye, like in the non conscious world or whatever, like in this intellectual world, it's like, I'm Lois, Lois and Clark <laughs> in my brain. I'm trying to think, it's really hard to like come up with an explorer that wasn't a colonizer. So it's like really hard to make those like comparisons. Um, let's see. Base Colton said Einstein, Einstein was. I, Einstein was a philosopher. I would like to consider him one. I think people normally think like I think he is considered one, but I think more most of the time people think of him as a scientist because of like MC squared or whatever, which apparently was only a very small piece of what he provided for us. Um, as a philosopher. Is there a place where we can more regularly chop up philosophy together? I'm looking to delve into making stuff that gets at this, and I would like to talk to Brittany and y'all about this stuff. Um, I have a Twitter and a Discord, if those are viable. Yeah, um, I think what I might do, especially if we start getting more people interested, I mean, I have no problem setting up just like a, a Zoom once a month. And whoever follows me on these channels wants to come in and, like, bring up topics that you want to talk about. And um, I have, like, no problem doing that. Maybe that would be something I could set up on, like, a Patreon. And, like, uh, as long as you subscribe to the Patreon for free, then you can get access to, like, the Zoom information. Um, because I would love to do that. Because I love talking about this stuff. And I haven't gotten... I would love to have more questions from people out from people that aren't in my inner network, right? Um, to kind of get their perspective and hear what they've learned. And I've already learned. So I got notes from tonight because I've learned things on this live stream that will help with my research. I definitely want to do that because I definitely think as I start putting out videos about um, my, my personality archetypes, this typing system, right? Prime archetypes is what it's called. Um, as I start bringing those videos out, uh, I would really like to sit down and have some feedback in a Zoom because this is a new uh, moving science or moving scientific tool and it's not it's not quite finished. And so I, I really want that feedback. Um, I have been, oh, let me see. I've been working on scripts. This is part one. And it's like seven pages. Um, and a lot of it is bullet points, which means it's just reminding me of something to talk about. <laughs> right? Because um, I do a lot of, lot of that. So it means that there's probably, if I actually like wrote down my actual script for this, it's probably like 10 or 12 pages. Um, but it is, it's also helping me organize for the book. So I'm starting to work. I'm hoping I'm going to be actually filming some of this this week uh, so I can start putting those videos out on disruptive philosophy so I can get a good foundation out there of the system and then we can speak in that language so we can understand because we'll have common terminology, right? So when I say like, oh, extroverted thinking or that's, um, you know, that's the exploration function or that's the do function or whatever, people will know what I'm talking about, right? Um, or I'm an INTJ, or like, let's talk about the shadow or whatever else. I There's like so many videos and content and pieces and like media I want to break down, but I have to put out that foundational piece of information, which is going to be quite a few videos. Like it's like, I have to give you guys like two semesters of, a, of, a, of lectures as a foundation for us to get into the other stuff for it to make sense, to be honest. Um... So I'm working on that and bear with me. And I'm, I appreciate all of you guys in the chat, especially frog and base. Like you guys have been all the time base. You're always with me and I love you. Um, <laughs> we've, we've had some good times together over this last year, but I really appreciate this feedback because I will admit like it's scary. 
I have fear about presenting this information because I don't have college degrees, right? And I'm uh, like, I am a black femme person, right? And I know that the comments are going to be, what are you talking about? You can't just make a new philosophy. This is, but this is what MBTI says. And they're going to be quoting people that they don't know literally did the same that thing that I did, right? Which is created a new system based on history and philosophy that other, and um, concepts that other people have created. And also people don't understand that like, that is what we are supposed to do, right? Carl Jung didn't die and leave us all of his amazing knowledge so that we would be stuck there and not expand on it, not find out things that he didn't have time in his lifetime to maybe explore because he created something from scratch, right? We've got to get over, you need to have letters and a, and, and a piece of paper from colonizer uh, educational institutions for you to be valid to talk about anything meaningful. And hopefully my channels and page and my content and me, myself as a person can help bridge that gap because I'm tired of listening or even been put being put down or not taken seriously or um, poo pooed, right? About these intellectual concepts, right? Or not even being able to be invited on the same stage to talk with people about this because I don't have letters behind my name and because I was sex worker, because I'm on the line, like I'm on the internet talking about sex work. Right? So what I'm saying can't be intellectually valid because this is, you know, philosophy. If only we knew how many philosophers were sex workers or how many philosophers got ideas from sex workers. Like, we don't know how many men got genuinely amazing ideas from women because women weren't allowed to fucking have credit for those things, right? There's a lot of invention, inventions that were made by slaves, but we won't know because if you own a slave and they create an invention, you don't name it after the slave, do you? No. That's my, like, if I'm the slave owner, that's my invention now. We need to start valuing individual anecdotal experience and knowledge that people have and stop only submitting to letters and authori authoritarian figure, like authoritarian figures, right? Unconsensual hierarchy figures but saying well they're in that position so they must be right and as a disruptive person my entire life I will tell you most of the time they're not those people in authority in authority positions played a game to get in that position are there for themselves and they can be wrong often and most of the time, if you think they're wrong, they are. And there's probably another person in that group that also thinks they're wrong. And if only we had the balls in every aspect of American society to stand up to those authoritarian figures, we would all be more free and the children in our future would be safer. But we don't. This is going to be rough, but it's because most of us are cowards. People will say things like, I had no other choice. Yeah, you did. Just the other choices were hard and uncomfortable, right? And you would have had to say something and stand out. And as much as we say we're trying to avoid conforming to anything, we do. We do conform because it's safer in the herd. Why would I run out of the herd to explore a different direction of pathway, right? Because I see that whoever's hurting us this way is literally taking us to like death, right? But that takes courage to be like, you know what? No, I'm not going that way. I'm gonna go this other way. And I'm gonna branch off and I'm gonna take some risk, right? But a lot of us don't because we don't wanna be uncomfortable and we don't wanna be in that situation, 
right? We don't want to be looked at. We're worried about the experience I've had so many times in my life where you get a group of people and they're like, yeah, we don't like that manager and the way he treats us and that's wrong and da, 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 da. And you get them all together and you're like, whoa, okay, let's go tell them manager. And I get up there and I'm like, Hey, so we think blah, 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 blah. And then about a few minutes in it, the manager's looking at me like, what do you mean we? And I look behind and like, ain't nobody there. Ain't nobody there. They're in their cars being like, no, nah, we, we thought we'd support you, Brittany. You're good at that. And that's why we all still live in bondage. Okay. Cause everyone's sitting around hoping Someone else will be the courageous, brave one that will say something or do something. And surprisingly enough, also, it normally only takes one or two people. And then everyone else is like, well, you know, that's what I was thinking anyways. <laughs> now that I see two other people are doing it, that's exactly what I was thinking. And you know what? I should be in charge. <laughs> and I'll be like, go ahead, honey. At least you're on the team. Okay. Okay. Did I mention that postmodernism can suck my anarchist dick? Okay, I just want to emphasize that. <laughs> okay, last thing, we're going to end on a happy, fun, kick-ass story about this African goddess, but queen. Same thing, right? Goddess, queen. <laughs> Her name is Tattoo Betol. Um... Uh, let me just check the comments real quick. Da, 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 da. That would be awesome. Help me through some tumultuous time. The notorious BCB. <laughs> risking embarrassment versus risking losing a future. Yeah. Yeah, it's risking momentary uncomfortableness and embarrassment for like the rest of your like, you know what I'm saying? Versus the rest of your life. Versus, you know, like being oppressed. Versus death, possibly or death for your children. Okay. Here we go, I'm excited about this. Let's tell this story. Um, oh man, do I need to put myself on the other side? Yeah, I do. Okay, hold on one second. We're gonna move this over here. Here we go. Yep, there we go. Okay. Tetu Batul lived from 1851 to 1918. Um, the nickname is the bad cop. Well, sorry, the name of this article is called the bad cop empress of Ethiopia. Now, yes, it was probably written by white people. So I guess I get it. If like, um, we're not living the cop life, <laughs> we're not doing the cop mindset, but we all understand the allegory of the good cop, bad cop. Okay. So here we go. Let's go ahead and tell this fun story. If you know anything about Africa's interactions with Europeans in the 1800s, you know that things didn't go great for the Africans. Well, isn't that a kind way of saying that? <laughs> um, time and time again, a European ally, ally, sorry, a European ally nation would just happen to witness some Maladi befall one of their new African buddies. As a good neighbor, the Europeans would then prescribe their traditional folk remedy, military invasion. And so, time and time again, African armies, uh, armies, African armies would go up against European ones and lose. But not in Ethiopia. Ooh, but not in Ethiopia. What happened in Ethiopia, you ask? Well, let's find out. When its ally, Italy, began invading, Ethiopia defeated them in battle, and in so doing, made Italy collectively lose its mind. And this crushing victory, due in large part to the foresight, skepticism, and unre unrelenting sass of one of the toughest women in Ethiopian history, Empress Tatu Batu. And I do not know if I'm pronouncing this name correctly. But here we go. Oh, the reason also I found this story is because I was looking up famous, inspiring 
INTJ women. And she happened to be an INTJ woman. And I will admit, it does make sense for how much of a rebellious little fucking bitch she was. <laughs> and I say that with love. <laughs> um, okay. From the get-go, tattoo. Hold on, I'm going to move. The, oh, nope, nope, nope. I messed up. I messed up. I forgot that this is on this screen. Okay. From the get-go, tattoo. I'm a herrick for son. Oh, okay. So tattoo means son in their language was an odd choice for Empress. As one of the Aroma people, a historically downtrodden ethnic group in Ethiopia, Tatu was subjected to female genital mutilation before she was even three months old. This left her unable to bear children, one of the main expectations of any female royal. Moreover, before marrying Emperor M uh, Menelik II, She'd had four husbands and was over 30 years old, an eternity in Ethiopian mar marital, uh, marital terms. So, not only was she a badass, as we're going to get to, but she was able to break a lot of the expected norms where she became queen, even though she was unable to bear children, and that um, she had been... She had four husbands before, and she was older, right? Either the king really saw strategic, what's the word? Strate strategic uh, usefulness, right? In her as a partner, or he fell in love with the bitch and she was a badass. Like she, she was also a badass in like being a queen and also like, Wooing the king. But they were a good match. Not only did her lineage give his reign legitimacy, she was linked to the uh, Solomonic dynasties, a fact that overrode any concerns of her Oromo heritage. But she made him a mere serious, oh, uh, sorry. But she made him a more serious ruler by curtailing his womanizing ways. Ooh, something so many women wish they could do. A popular song of the time played off Tattoo's name and that of Menelik's hated mistress, saying the sun, Tattoo, uh, has dissipated the fog, the mistress. With Tattoo's help, Menelik gradually united the warring factions of Ethiopia under one banner. Tatu came in and said, um, <laughs> mistresses be gone. King loves me now. Thank you. <laughs> also, I'm going to help him win wars. So I'm a little more valuable than you cuties. Um, yeah. Would swoon. Yeah. <laughs> Swooning. Uh, this is uh, King Malik here. Menelik. Menelik. Uh, and his uh, chiefs. The two settled into a well-polished good cop, bad cop routine. Menelik would regularly straggle and avoid taking unpopular stances by saying, Ishi Naga, yes, tomorrow. While Tetu would decisively say, mm, Imbi, I don't know exactly how to pronounce their language, uh, but uh, im, i, i, im, Eh, 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 eh. How would you pronounce that? Eh, mm. I don't know if we use that word, that like pronunciation of I next to M. It doesn't work. I love language, though. I'd love to learn how to pronounce it correctly. Uh, Tetu would decisively say MB, uh, which means absolutely not. So the king is like, yes, yes, tomorrow. And the queen is like, no, bitch, <laughs> not happening. Thanks for asking love her. She became a savvy advisor to his every political move, interrupting negotiations, often in a decisive and res resolutely hostile way. She was one of the first to realize Italy's intentions to make Ethiopia its thrall and bluntly called Italy out on it. You want other countries to see Ethiopia as your protege, but that will never be. Mm. 
this is a lot of this story confirms that whoever typed her as an INTJ was probably accurate. By the time, uh, by the time Italy, or sorry, by the time Italian Ethiopian relations broke down in 1891, Italian diplomat diplomats came to describe Menelik as weak, uncertain, and in the hands of his wife, which is to say, good hands. been told I have good hands. <laughs> mm, I love this woman. Like, I love this story. Victory is ours. After multiple attempts to sue for peace, Menelik and Tetu settled in to repel Italy's Im imminent invasion. Tetu joined her husband on the front lines. Joined her husband on the front lines, okay? By the way, her husband was also on the front lines, something that a lot of our Western cultures don't like to do, okay? Yeah. She joined him. Traveling around with a personal force of 5,000 soldiers who, under her task master guidance, kept perfect order. Witnessing the professionalism of her troops, a European observer wrote that Tetu is a great lady who perhaps in another Melu would have been a Christian of Sweden or Catherine, or sorry, had been a Christina of Sweden or Catherine the Great. Meaning basically like if she wasn't black, we'd write legend legendary stories about her. <laughs> Yeah, white person code for if she wasn't black. Look, I did not I didn't even fucking read that. I was just like, duh. Yeah. Is a great lady who perhaps in another me Milu would have been a Christina of Sweden or Catherine the Great. Well, you know what? I think we should call her Tatu the Great of Italy. <laughs> oh, sorry. I get excited. Okay, let's continue with her story. Tetu's shining moment in the war came in the 18 it came with the 1896 siege of uh Mikel, we'll just say. Here the Italians were holed up in a fortress where they easily repelled Ethiopian assaults. Tetu took 900 of her men aside and instructed them to cut off the fort's water supply. They did so, and after 10 days of increasingly horrific suffering, the Italians surrendered. The Italians surrendered. I love a good surrender without losing, like, one person in my army, you know? Like, that's the way I love to, like, win a battle, <laughs> you know? Like, if I'm gonna win a battle... <sighs> I would like you to surrender. A month later, the war ended with the Battle of Edwa, where Italy suffered a humiliating defeat at the hands of a united Ethiopia. In multiple, like, exaggerated histories of the battle, Tetu strode into the fighting herself. After seeing her soldiers begin to lose heart, she dismounted, removed her veil, and yelled, Courage! Victory is ours! Strike! Some tellings even have the middle-aged woman armed to the teeth and plunging headlong into the fray, which provided much fodder for earlier drafts of the above illustration. This illustration here. I mean, I believe she did it. There were definitely, um, I mean, there have been many accounts of leaders coming into battle and screaming things. Um, it may have been hard to hear her, so it was more if you saw your leader. Yes, everybody go to sleep and sleep well. Thank you. Uh, you can catch this on the replay. I'll probably cut this out as a clip. Thank you so much for joining me all night. It's been great. So what does she think? Uh, who? Sorry, what? Who does she think she is? Empress Tetu. After the Italian defeat, the European nations shocked at the Ethiopian victory, began negotiating in good faith, often with Tetu herself. The Italians, when negotiating for the release of their prisoners of war, specifically asked to speak to Tetu. The Italian accounts of the time showed a country as divided as the United States after Vietnam 
uh, war, with some clamoring for revenge and others questioning why they even gone there in the first place. The Italian press took very polar stances on Tatu herself, while some compared her to Zenobia, Cleopatra, and Joan of Arc. Others spun up her, uh, ooh, hurrah, hooray, hooray, tales of how she bathed in blood, gossiped about her early marriages, and purported side lovers and began calling her a modern Jezebel. I hope she bathed in blood. To be fair, she was a divisive figure even among her people. On the one hand, she was capable of great mercy and societal progress. She personally cooked for prisoners and starving countrymen, uh, inaugurated the Ethiopian Red Cross, founded the new capital of Addis Ababa, and worked to kickstart many national industries, including wine production, candle making, and more. In the words of one observer, she applied herself not only to feminine works, but like Quicksilver, attended to perplexing business usually done by men and succeeded at it. Guilty. Mm -hmm. We share that in common. <laughs> On the other hand, she could be a brutal politician and ruler. She filled the government with nepotistic political appointments in order to solidify her political base, especially as Menelik's health declined. She was linked to a staggering number of poisonings. She persecuted those who spread foreign religions, and she was rude to the point of xenophobic with European envoys. Although given Ethiopia's history with Italy, the last point is a bit more understandable. Yeah, xenophobic, meaning she was not kind to the white people. We can understand. <laughs> and to wrap up, also in the accounts of many Europeans, she grew fat. <laughs> not that it had anything to do with anything, but they felt the need to mention it at length repeatedly. <laughs> When Menelik's health took a plunge, Tetu beca became de facto ruler for a couple of years, and it took the um, and it and it took a massive conspiracy on the parts of much of the Ethiopian elite to oust her from power. When Menelik finally died, Tetu stepped down and lived a fairly a, a fairly quiet life until her death. Her reputation lived on long past her death, both in Ethiopia, where she became a national heroine, and in Italy, where she was, for a time at least, the linguistic gold standard for a lofty woman. The once popular phrase, Ci si credi di escra la regina tatu, <laughs> it's my best Italian, <laughs> translates to, who does she think she is? Empress Tatu? And it is a saying that I've heard still to this day is, is used in Italy. I think that she probably has a great afterlife because she is well remembered. And I loved that story. So hopefully y'all enjoyed it too. Uh, I was just checking the comments and I, I love that they're like, get your lucid dream plan ready. Love it. Love it. This has been great. I know it's a bit of a long live stream. I didn't do one for like uh, last week and I was planning on to. And so the topics kind of stacked up. And then also this gives me plenty of clips. Okay. Uh, which gives me more time to work on my video essays for disruptive philosophy, which is what I will be working on for the next six to seven weeks. Yep. Yep. So I can have some out in March. If you have not checked out my video essay on uh, America's War on Children, How Capitalism is Child Abuse, it is on disruptive philosophy. And right now it is coming out chapter by chapter on Wednesdays and Fridays for the next couple of weeks. There are eight chapters. Sorry, there's nine chapters, um, but it'll be eight video releases. Please check those out or you can watch them in the playlist or you can watch the whole video essay. It is seven and a half hours long. It is also on my channel. It is my manifesto, <laughs> like it is, it is uh, my great work, one of my great works. And it kind of is a good foundation on like why I am talking about the things I'm talking about. So hopefully you enjoyed this. Thank you very much. I'm going to go now edit clips and, 
I'm gonna go eat something sweet. I'm gonna go spoil myself, maybe have some ice cream. This was good. Thank you, everyone, especially Base Colton and a frog of Anarchist Productions. I see you, Joy. Jo uh. God, I keep saying wrong words tonight. I'm like super excited and talking too fast, okay? <laughs> Joe, thank you and good night. Also, I didn't get a notification for this live, but I had the bell on. I don't know why. Ugh. Because YouTube sucks. I think it might have been because I didn't schedule it. May possibly. I don't know why. I didn't schedule it. I just went live. So I will try to, uh, I will do my best to schedule them at least like the day before the day of, and that way that should give you a notification. Cause I know when I schedule them, it'll show up 30 minutes before I think. And then when it happens on other people's channels, but also YouTube is a bitch. Like YouTube unsubscribes people from our channels, from like channels. It's weird. I hate it, but it is the world we live in. Thank you, everyone. Be blessed. Show some love to people and share this and help me with the algorithm. You know how to do. Yeah, the algorithm might be messing around too. It always is. Oh, the algorithm is such a messy bitch. Gets around the block. Messy, messy, messy. Messy, messy bitch, the algorithm.